is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, September 10th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Peter Edelman, formerly worked for Senator Robert F. Kennedy, was in the Clinton administration where he resigned in protest of Bill Clinton's signing of the AFDC welfare reform legislation. An author of Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. Also on the program today, breaking news. Yeah, what the heck? The mustache has left the building. The mustache has left the building. It's disgusting. Disgusting. John Goodbye, Bolton. Walrus. John Bolton fired from the White House. Literally. Well. I shouldn't say that it's a causal, but it's certainly, uh, if you're looking for a sign that we will not have a war with Iran anytime soon, John Bolton leaving the White House is uh, about as good as it gets. Also on the program today, the CIA extracted a Russian spy, a top Russian spy, for fear that Donald Trump would reveal that spy's presence. We were just bonding so much, and, and we were stablemates. He was bragging. I was bragging. One thing led to another. Big bellwether election in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District uh, today. Compliments of a massive Republican vote fraud scandal. Meanwhile, think progress implodes. Union steps in. Democrats look to jam Senate Republicans with a vote on Trump's stealing funds for his border wall. And 50 U.S. states open an antitrust investigation of Google. Meanwhile, Wilbur Ross, Commerce Secretary, threatened to fire top employees at NOAA if they reported the weather accurately. Trump's approval slips as people get gloomy about the economy. And the Koch brothers' data machine helped the most bigoted Republican candidates in the country attack immigrants. Lastly, Andrew Cuomo under fire for his failed corporate giveaways in New York State, all in the wake of that Amazon deal Still paying benefits for the state as they now have the guts to reevaluate these corporate uh, giveaways in New York State that even if they panned out the way that they're, they always are sold to us as panning out would be questionable. Uh, but the fact is they never do. They never do. And uh, so that's uh, finally we're seeing some scrutiny. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Full complement of folks here today. I uh, want to make sure uh, Jamie has two things uh, to plug that I want to make sure that we do at the top of the show while people hear it. Jamie, go. Yeah. So oh, let me put myself on camera. Um, do I do the fun one first? Sure. Um, my show, The Antifada, is doing a live show with Pod Dam America at Littlefield in Brooklyn on October 12th. And tickets are now up for sale. So October 12th, go check it out. You can uh, buy those tickets. We have a link at the majority.fm site. I will put one there. And 
Second thing. The second thing is, um, if anyone's in the New York area, Close the Camps NYC is doing a big nonviolent direct action this coming weekend, and they need way more people. So if you're in the area and you want to help out, go to closethecampsnyc.com. Let me double check. Well, we'll put that on the Yeah, yeah. The I'll put a link there too. And if you are not in NYC, you can go to closethecamps.us to find out about anti-ICE pro-immigrant justice actions in your area. Now, speaking of the anti-immigrant policies of this uh, White House, I mean, that, that seems to be the one thing. Well, there are two things, to be fair, that Donald Trump has remained steadfast and consistent about throughout his administration. It is the only two things that they've been able to achieve. One is massive tax cuts, many of which actually just benefits specifically Donald Trump, but also uh, largely uh, corporations. The second thing is to make it U.S. policy, stated policy, to intimidate, to harass, to marginalize, to deport, to criminalize immigrants, refugees, People who are here because of civil wars, people who, because, uh, who are here because of violence, because of, uh, of uh, natural disasters, people who are here simply because they want to make uh, better lives for themselves and their children. I've got a story uh, in the, um, from the New York Times of, of, of children who have diseases who are being kicked out of the country. They've been here on def uh, deferred uh, action because of illness. Jonathan Sanchez looking to be deported uh, to Honduras. If he is, he will die, writes Jorge uh, Ramos in the New York Times opinion. 16-year-old suffers from cystic fibrosis, the same illness that killed his older sister, Though the government official who sent Jonathan's parents a letter telling them they should leave the United States within a month didn't seem to care. What will happen if you're sent back to Honduras, I asked him during an interview. Well, basically, I will die, he told me. He was talking from near Boston Children's Hospital where he receives a treatment that's helping him deal with a lethal cough, among other things. Cystic fibrosis causes a buildup of mucus in the lungs that cannot be removed. Um, if I miss treatment for one day, I start coughing a lot. I get tired. I find it hard to breathe. I have stomach aches and I can't digest food. Um, this is going on around the country and, uh, not only with people who are here, this 16 year old, uh, apparently does not have, uh, documents, does not have citizenship here, um, There's about a thousand people in this country who benefit from life-saving uh, 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 program this year, which is that deferred deferred enforcement because of uh, of illness. They're all going to get booted. Meanwhile, yesterday we reported on what was happening, coming from a ship uh, from the Bahamas, a an investigative reporter from uh, from Florida was on that boat and do we have a footage? What's the name of the report? Brian Enton up here. Brian Enton. And um, he had footage that we played for you yesterday where he interviewed a couple of people who were getting kicked off this boat. The last minute they're on the boat, they're being told that all of a sudden for the first time ever, they need a visa to go to the United States that uh, the normal documentation wasn't going to work. Here's a dad with his uh, daughter being uh, thrown off the boat. These are people who have nowhere, obviously, where to go. They're evacuating and normally uh, you can travel, right? the Bahamas. Right. Yeah, normally you can use police record by way of airplane at least. Yeah. So you have to take your baby off? Yes. Yeah, so okay, and so that was one of 119 people who were uh, had to leave the boat. I want you to take a look at the folks that are coming off, a lot of them holding kids. Uh, a lot of them are kids walking off. Um, men, women, just uh, people who are escaping because of the, the massive destruction that took place in the Bahamas. Supposedly, the CPB officials 
uh, claimed that when they were interviewed uh, in Florida, that, oh, no, no, this was a function of the uh, the cruise line of the boat uh, 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 operators. They uh, they did, they they just didn't want to do uh, what they needed to do or whatever it was. However, here is uh, Donald Trump explaining, no, we had to kick all those children and parents and, and, and people off that boat to save America. So we're talking to a lot of different people on that. You know, we're recovering from the hurricane also. Florida did get hit, not as hard as we anticipated. And you look at Georgia, you look at South Carolina, North Carolina. I'm going to North Carolina right now, North Carolina, to have a rally for Dan Bishop. But before I go to the rally, we're going to be stopping at one of the sites that got hit very hard by the hurricane. So we're also recovering from a hurricane. But we have to be very careful. Everybody needs totally proper documentation because the, look, the, the uh, Bahamas had some tremendous problems with people going to the Bahamas that weren't supposed to be there. I don't want to allow people that weren't supposed to be in the Bahamas to come in to the United States, including some very bad people and some very bad gang members and some very, very bad drug dealers. So we are going to be very, very strong in that. Let me let me just explain. Pause. Well, let me let me explain something too. All these people had passports. All these people had passports and had been certified by the police. That is what is typically needed to get into the United States. So he's lying. He's lying about that. Large sections, believe it or not, of the Bahamas were not hit. And what we're doing is bringing the people to those sections of the Bahamas that have not been hit. We've done a lot of the uh, USA aid. We've done a lot of work with our Coast Guard, with our FEMA people who have been phenomenal. So in other words, we can't let these people in because they're criminals. But, but actually what we're really doing is just taking them to other places in the Bahamas, which is OK. Now, clearly, I am sure there are other places in the Bahamas that weren't uh, hit uh, nearly as much. Maybe, maybe more or less, you know, nothing more than a tropical storm. But the people who are on this boat obviously are coming because they have family in the United States. And we just have an administration that hates immigrants, particularly when they are not of the same complexion as Donald Trump. I mean, it's just, it's irrefutable. And uh, the idea that in this type of like, I, I, it's just amazing to me there isn't more outcry about this. It's disgusting. It really is disgusting. Yeah. Um, there were about 300 people there at the last Close the Camps action that I went to in New York. And there should be thousands of people at this point in time. At this point in the in the journey, shall we say? I think people have just become I don't know uh, exhausted, or I have no idea what it is. But um, it's you know, in part, frankly, in, in part, uh, this I think largely this is a a function of the demobilization that uh, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer have overseen by tampering down the investigations and just the assault on the, the Trump administration. I mean, look, here's the bottom line about this, about impeachment. This is sort of a, a side note. The founders of this country, the people who wrote the Constitution, they contemplated Donald Trump. Not him exactly, but they contemplated a person like Donald Trump being president, that there could be someone of this ilk who is problematic, who is enriching themselves, who is um, uh, uh, flaunting um, uh, the, the Constitution and uh, different uh, statutory requirements, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What they did not contemplate was Nancy Pelosi, was an opposition party that just says, no biggie, people have the chance to vote him out. We don't need to do anything because people will vote him out. They did not contemplate that. They gave the apparatus 
for an opposition party, or theoretically, I guess, the same party, to deal with a Donald Trump. They did not anticipate that they would not use it. And so when we think about what has gone wrong in the United States, just in this very limited, we're talking about a very limited issue set here, because obviously a lot of other problems that Donald Trump is symptomatic of. But when we talk about why Donald Trump is in office with no threat, and I know they're doing stuff now at the Judiciary Committee, but, but, but Nancy Pelosi successfully, you know, mission accomplished. But that just purposefully denying refugees from a natural disaster, the ability to come to this country, 125 people. That should be like the latest thing that is added into the inquiry. An inquiry that should have been already in operation for six months. And when we look back on this era, when historians look back and say what went wrong in terms of the way that the country could deal with Donald Trump, it's going to be Nancy Pelosi. That is the, that is, um, the aberration here. The, the, it's going to be Nancy Pelosi was the sort of flaw in the system that was not contemplated. That you would have an opposition party that would just say, eh, he'll impeach himself. I mean, it's ridiculous. Oh. Yeah, uh. I, I'm, I'm mad about it. It's, it's, it's just, it's unbelievable because he has complete impunity at this point. And it's going to be a lot worse if he wins uh, the re-election. Yeah, no crap. Oh, well, meanwhile, uh, on a different note, I could use a little hydration, probably. Uh, and staying uh, properly hydrated is one of the most important factors uh, during the summer, but frankly, at all times. Liquid IV is the fastest, most efficient way to stay hydrated. We fight over these things in the office. I got to bring in more. I Wait, do we have some left? I don't think we do. Um, I think uh, people need to, you know, obviously when you're after your exercise, but when you travel, when you drink too much, when you're getting a cold, when you feel like you're getting a cold, um, be great if we all have the ability to drink, uh, you know, 16 bottles of water a day. But if you can't, liquid IV um, provides the same hydration as drinking about two to three bottles uh, of water. It's the fastest growing wellness brand in the country, as far as I know. Plus, it contains five essential vitamins, including more vitamin C than an orange and as much potassium as a banana. Healthy alternative to traditional sugary sports drinks, no artificial flavors, no artificial preser preservatives or any preservatives. And it's perfect for fueling tough workouts, preventing muscle fatigue, promoting healthy post-workout recovery. Like I say also for the type of, you know, for me, it's a little more drinking situation. Recovery mode. You can find them everywhere. The hydration multiplier is even sold at all Costco's nationwide. Oh, nice. I'm picture Sam's get carried out of the bar. Like, Nancy Pelosi. Exactly. All right, sir, we're going to get you a cab. And then, I've, <laughs> and then honestly, like the first thing I do, remember to drink liquid IV when I get home. Like, I love liquid IV. I know you're going to too. Right now, our listeners get 25% off at liquidiv.com when you use the code majority at checkout. That's 25% off of anything you order at Liquid IV's website. Go to liquidiv.com, enter my promo code, majority, get your savings, start getting better hydration. Liquidiv.com, promo code majority. Don't wait, start properly hydrating today. We, of course, put a link in the uh, podcast description to that. And um, there's still a little bit of sun. Summer's running out. You don't want to be stuck. I know it's a drag. You don't want to be stuck in the office when you don't have to be. Uh, people, what what software? What what software should I get to uh, make my uh, my company more efficient? Well, I got to stay in the office and check it out. Well, I mean, actually, for me, it's next. It's sort of fun, but um, 
Find the right software at capterra.com slash majority. It is a free and I think the biggest online resource to find the best software solution for your business. They have over 950,000, nearly a million reviews of specific software products from real software users. They have 700 specific categories of software, more than that. Everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio management. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Capterra makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Super easy, super straightforward. I'm just in the eyes and I'm looking at different things like iPad POS software. What does that possibly mean? I think it means point of sale. And then I'm thinking like I could use that maybe. We sell t-shirts if we ever do a live show again. Uh, issue tracking software. I don't know. I don't know. Is the issues like political issues? I have no idea. Um, a bunch of software. that are not jail management software, janitorial software, job shop software, K through 12 software, kennel software, landscape software, landing page software, lead capture software, every single business you can find. It's crazy. Live chat software. Actually, you know what? I'm going to save that because we need to put something on the back of end of our blog. Mailroom management software. It goes on and on, folks. You get the idea. And there's reviews within these categories. There's multiple pieces of software that get reviewed. You figure out which one is the best solution for you. Boom, you're done. Visit capterra.com slash majority for free. Go there today. Find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Capterra.com slash majority. Capterra, that's C A P T E. R-R-A dot com slash majority. All right, going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Peter Edelman. Not a crime to be poor, the criminalization of poverty in America. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center, author of Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. Peter Edelman, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. Um, so your book starts uh, more or less with a, with a history of, of poverty, and um, you have uh, certainly had um, um, uh, real involvement in, in the sort of ongoing, I guess, fight on poverty, war on poverty. Uh, but give us a little bit of history. Uh, you know, perhaps let's start uh, around uh, the New Deal, I guess, in this country where we um, really, maybe for the first time, had... Um, an active federal government attempting to alleviate poverty in this country and walk us through when um, through those years where the fight turned to be sort of got turned on its head a little bit. I think uh, you're starting at exactly the right place. Uh, of course, uh, we didn't have the capacity as a, as a country uh, or at least we thought so, um, to to uh, do what we began to do with the New Deal. 
uh, in the Great uh, Depression. So uh, the, the first thing that one thinks of when we're when we're thinking about uh, poverty and low income is uh, Social Security in 1935. Uh, and uh, we also got a minimum wage for, uh, for the first time. Uh, so um, there was there was the the uh, commitment uh, in terms of the national government to uh, make things better uh, in terms of income uh, that that was never tried before. Uh, and so that's the beginning. And then. Um, we go through uh, World War II uh, and uh, not so much more because we were uh, struggling with other uh, enormously important things. And uh, so the next uh, big change uh, in the development for, for uh, low-income people uh, is uh, with uh, President Kennedy, uh, President Johnson, and, and uh, the war on poverty. Um, and uh, and also the consequences of civil rights uh, because uh, uh, the civil rights movement and the and the great uh, uh, statutes that were passed uh, in sixty four sixty five sixty eight uh, made a tremendous if you look at the uh, the uh, poverty for African American uh, Americans uh, it uh, was fifty five percent poverty. Uh, in 1959, and uh, by 1973, it had gone down to 31 percent. Uh, so that's partly because of, of laws that affect uh, all races, but also because of, of what civil rights uh, did do. And so uh, there were both uh, because of the uh, economy, which was strong uh, through that period and through the, uh, the civil rights and uh, various uh, programs uh, as well. By 1973, we were down uh, as a country to 11.1 percent. That's the lowest that we ever got. Um, and uh, just to give you the the uh, look ahead, uh, yesterday we found out uh, that the 2018 numbers uh, got us down to 11.8 percent. Um, so we're getting back down there. It was 11.3 at the end of President Clinton. Those were the low low times uh, in the amount of poverty. And what's happened uh, over that period of time from 1973 to now and having those numbers be uh, uh, basically the same as they are and have not gotten better um, – is because um, we've had a, 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 a turned into uh, a, a ha having we're a low wage uh, country. I think anybody listening knows that, uh, and and so the, the 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 good jobs, the manufacturing jobs went away, uh, and we were pushing against that uh, for for really the half of the people in this country uh, have not had a raise. Uh, the basically about the same. The, the numbers may look a little bit, but that's because there's been some uh, inflation, and so that's what the struggle has been here uh, now. Now for uh, really uh, half of a century, uh, and it's important to understand that uh, underneath that uh, we have done a lot. Uh, you know, you hear over and again uh, people who are against the public pro uh, programs that we have. They say, "Oh well, uh, th those things didn't work because, gee whiz, the poverty didn't go uh, uh, go down." The fact is that uh, if we didn't have Social Security and and uh, food stamps, SNAP as it's now called, uh, and uh, the earned income tax credit and and uh, vouchers and, and a whole number of things. The uh, 40 uh, million or so that we have now, now a little bit under 40 million people, uh, it would be uh, more like uh, 85 to 90 percent uh, of of the um, uh, of the million uh, right. th 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 that number of people 
about 90 million people instead of 40 million, 40 million people. We, so, it's in really, other words, really for, for, it's so important for people to understand that. So uh, we would have uh, more than double in, uh, in, in poverty right now were it not for uh, things like Social Security and, like you say, food stamps and uh, the uh, earned income tax credit. And, yeah. we, and we should also absolutely, say, absolutely. Uh, and when, 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 you know, we talk about Social Security and the New Deal, uh, there were obviously a lot of people who were left out, uh, particularly African-Americans um, and, uh, and women to some extent, uh, based upon the jobs that were available for Social Security at the time. That is, you know, um, in, in some respects, we still live with some of that legacy. Uh, but um, and some of it was fixed, uh, you know, during the, the, the era you talk about in the mid 60s. Um, just before we, we we talk about that that change to uh, in the 90s when 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 poverty becomes criminalized in some fashion, um, but just more broadly on the question of poverty, like what um, w- what hampered the 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 progress as we went into the 70s? Like what was it just simply a function of the will to um, to diminish poverty? began to wane and uh from a political standpoint we could maintain where we had gotten in terms of progress but we couldn't go further what what happened to that so uh going back to the 70s uh but you're quite right to to sort of put a marker uh on on the 90s and and uh uh one aspect of what clinton did um but you had uh, both the fact that we had lost all those good jobs, uh, and and we became this low wage uh, country, uh, as I as I mentioned before, and then uh, as we go through that period of time up until now, uh, uh, we had uh, Pre- President Reagan, who uh, was very uh, uh, negative when it came to do anything about people uh, at the very lowest uh, end, and so. Uh, uh, and I have to say, uh, I believe that uh, the Democrats, I'm a Democrat, um, didn't do enough uh, to, to understand uh, what was going on with all of these uh, low-paid jobs and not doing enough about it. So that that problem uh, of the fact that people uh, sort of were left uh, behind, if you will, nobody really doing, I think that connects. Uh, to the to the politics of 2016, of people, uh, particularly in the Rust Belt, uh, and we saw the results in, in, in the presidential results. Uh, in, a, in a large way, uh, that's people who are disgusted with with, with uh, both parties. Um, so it's very important politically. Well, that takes us up then uh, into the 90s. And there are two major problems here. Uh, one I already talked about a number of times, which is which is the, the low wage jobs. The other is the people at the very bottom, uh, because we now have people uh, of of uh, in the the way we measure these things, 18 million people uh, out of those 40 million I was talking about are people whose income is below half. Uh, the poverty line. Uh, and, this this and is referred means, to as extreme poverty, right? I mean, extreme that's extreme poverty. Literal, yeah. that, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And so these are people. If you're, uh, if you got uh, three people in your house, uh, instead of the the poverty line, which is about twenty thousand dollars, it's about ten thousand. And we have 18 million people who are in that position. Uh, it's just terrible, and we've done very, very little about it. But and the major, major part of that, unfortunately, took place uh, when the so-called welfare reform of 1996 took place, and just uh, ha- what what's happened as a result of the, on cash assistance uh, has just been smashed. I can give you detail. I mean, basically, you have less than 3 million people in the country who get cash assistance, and so you have 7 million people in this country whose only income is from food stamps, SNAP. Uh, that's a terrible thing, and those are our two major things now as we look f- forward. Uh- Peter, the, the, the lousy jobs and what's happened at the very bottom. I, I want to actually uh, tease some of that out because I, I don't think that, that folks are um, there, there's so much. We are constantly uh, bombarded with this notion that uh, we are handing out um, 
um, so much money, blowing so much money on just giving people cash who don't deserve it, et cetera, et cetera. I want to I want to just um, stay on this for a bit and and remind sure. folks that uh, you were a, an official in the Clinton uh, administration when this uh, this major welfare reform, as it's called, was uh, enacted and signed by Bill Clinton. You resigned in protest. Um, and um, maybe let's let's start with those figures that you were talking about in terms of who to receive cash and whatnot. But why um, what what was it that you saw about this program that you knew that was was so problematic? Well, what happened, uh, and I did quit, of course, um, is that we, uh, well, the, the, the previous uh, welfare uh, wasn't anything to, you know, to write home about. Uh, it, it needed, uh, people were uh, not getting enough uh, help to get out of uh, receiving uh, being on welfare. Uh, and and uh, This is aid for and, dependent uh, uh, families and children? Is that what it was? AF, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but um, I thought, and a lot of us felt, we need to be worked harder to help people uh, get jobs and be more stable. Anyway, it went the other way. And the heart of what you asked, uh, after 1996, it's what's called a block grant. And what that means is that nobody has a right to anything. Uh, it's entirely up of the of the states, uh, and they literally, under federal law, didn't have to help anybody. Uh, and it turns out now that there's a lot of states that fundamentally don't help anybody, except for food stamps, which is a, fe a, a federal uh, program. So we're now down to the point where, it, when, when in 1996. 68% of uh, children's living, children living in families, low-income families, were getting cash assistance. A lot of states that was only a little bit, but they were getting it, 68%. Now it's 23% of children living uh, in, in low-income families. That's what's happened to it, I said before. So, that's why 14 million, uh, million people in 1993 getting cash assistance, which, by the way, was too many, to get below 3 million now because the states have absolutely they can do whatever they want with the money so how many so so when you say that only 23 percent of children living in poverty are getting cash assistance um how many states are we looking at that don't provide any cash assistance and when we say states don't provide any cash assistance that means that the federal government is not providing cash assistance because that money goes through these states but for snap and my understanding is that for SNAP, the highest amount that I think an individual can get on SNAP is somewhere around like, what, is it 200 bucks a month in terms of food? Uh, you know, food allowance, essentially? It's, uh, let's uh, uh, stop on that for a second. Uh, the way I do it, it's the same thing that you're saying. But uh, for a family uh, of three, uh, it's about $6,000. A year, uh, and uh, again, that's the, the uh, poverty line is twenty thousand for family of three, and that should be higher than it is. So yes, I mean, uh, if if you don't get anything, if you don't get any cash assistance, and the only thing you're getting food stamps is going to be six thousand dollars a year, and you can get it down to months and so on, but it's six thousand for a year for a for a family of three. That's that's what we have for about seven million people in our country. It's astonishing uh, n n number of things. Now, you asked whether anybody, any state is out of the business completely. Well, not quite, but uh, you have a number of states, uh, Texas, Minnesota, uh, Mississippi, sorry, not Minnesota, and, um, and uh, Wyoming and uh, North Carolina and others where they are uh, reaching 5% or less. Of the of the low income kids of the family living and so it's almost in effect zero. Wow, it's it's amazing. It's shocking. And so, what do they do with that money? I mean, they're getting uh, these block grants from the U.S. government, yeah. from the federal government, yeah. and they're not passing on the cash directly. What are they doing with that money? 
They use it for various other things uh, that uh, a number of them using it for, for other kinds of things like paying for their their child welfare. You know, when you're talking about a kid in foster care, uh, Texas, for example, is a place that, that about half of their uh, uh, money uh, that they should be spending from some other place are taking the TANF money, as we call it now. Uh, and uh, it does not go uh, to, to uh, the families themselves. Some of them have some programs uh, that do one thing or another, but, but the actual cash assistance is down to those numbers that, that right. I mentioned. And, and, uh, and they actually use some things that don't have anything to do with, with low-income people at all. So how rigorous is the federal oversight? On, I mean, so this is also, I mean, a lesson for people as to why when we hear block grants about any federal program, people get very concerned because then it, it really is essentially not that program. It's just a pool of money. How, um, what, how is there, are there any parameters as to how that money must be used or is it just so, uh, the parameters are so wide and ambiguous that essentially a, a decent, um, I don't know, comptroller in a state can figure out how to shift that money around? Essentially, that that's right, and and of course you hear people uh, on the Republican side saying that TANF is an enormous success, uh, and we ought to do the same thing for SNAP, and and, and indeed uh, uh, we got about uh, one vote to to having it have, go to Medicaid, which would be shocking. Um, and and would be disastrous uh, in many many states. So uh, the fact that that people go around and and they don't understand what you and I are talking about and 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 believe without understanding these facts that we're talking about say say that uh, TANF is a tremendous success, but in fact it's a horrible a failure. So um, we really need to understand that. And yes, there, there number one, there's very little the block grant. You, you you nailed it. Uh, very little uh, uh, saying in the statute of what you can sp- uh, spend it on. And secondly, that there's very little looking over the shoulder of anybody. So to the extent that uh, states are, are actually not uh, obeying the laws, uh, nobody does anything about it. Okay, so uh, we have that that takes place in uh, in the 90s. And there's simultaneously, there is essentially we have... Um, a growing anti-tax movement that really starts uh, before then, uh, you know, under uh, Reagan. And this creates a sort of uh, a second order problem in that the 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 anti-tax revolt is not just on the federal level. It's on the state level. And it begins to drain the coffers of states and municipalities, which then creates a whole nother set of of uh, of problems for people living in poverty. Absolutely, and very sadly, uh, and and for a long time, uh, we were not really aware that this has happened. Uh, we we woke up as a country uh, uh, when uh, we had the uh, the tragedy uh, in in uh, in Missouri. Um, and um, the the uh, you know with Michael Brown uh, was killed by the police officer there, and uh, it turns out that uh, their uh, the uh, Department of Justice went in and and uh, found out this weird thing where uh, people were the, the people who lived there, and maybe some people who went from other places were. Uh, Arrested and, uh, and because they didn't have enough taxes to 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 run the place, and Ferguson uh, became the place uh, that that we we found out. Uh, that was not just in Ferguson, where people were thrown in, in jail because uh, they couldn't uh, pay uh, couldn't pay uh, traffic tickets and, and and other things. And it turns out that it exists uh, all over the country. 
in places all over the country. Uh, some of it is individual things where uh, somebody doesn't uh, uh, have a permit to, to uh, mow their own lawn or something like that. But the big thing that's happened as a national thing is taking away people's uh, 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 driver's license. license license for for driving, S- uh, suspending those driver's license uh, licenses, and uh, it's just shocking. Uh, it, it, we know that uh, well over forty states are, are doing that. We're talking between that and other kinds of of, of things, like I mentioned. Um, the best we I don't know that these numbers. I we, we think what I'm about to tell you it's bigger than that but about 10 million people uh, owe about 50 billion dollars uh, it's just it's just absolutely shocking and what it means in people's lives uh, particularly with regard to taking away driver's licenses is people have to use their their cars so this is great from from the point of view of getting revenue which remember is what you started the conversation with quite correctly um, so we took uh, the uh, go to work or uh, take child to school or, or go to the grocery store, what, whatever it is, and you drive with that license and you get nailed again. And so these amounts, and it isn't just the, 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 the fines themselves, which are way jacked up. I mean, anybody listening to this in, the, in their own state uh, knows that what used to be $50 is now $500 in state after state. There's fees as well that have no connection to, to anything except money uh you know the courthouse library things like that and then it's more than that because uh if you get put on a probation you have to pay for that in 44 states it's unbelievable uh and and so uh you have all of these things you're you're in jail or you're in prison turns out in state after state you have to pay uh for the room and board in those places and this is all i mean people it's, it's just it's literally crazy and the country's kind of making up. Don't you think people are kind of b- beginning to know oh, that this is going on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think we've we've done uh, a couple of interviews over the past year or two, particularly I mean, mostly in the wake of Ferguson, uh, where this yeah. dynamic, where the um, where where police departments end up becoming revenue machines for these cities, uh, these counties, uh, the states. Um, but here is a question I have uh, for you in this, and there and there's there's plenty of examples. I mean, I think people understand the dynamic that, and and perhaps this is maybe I'm answering my own question here, where mm-hmm. uh, if I um, fine uh, someone uh, five hundred dollars uh, for uh, or I, I fine someone fifty dollars for uh, rolling through a stop sign. Um, I think people are aware that uh, in an emergency, half the country couldn't even come up with four hundred dollars within a couple of weeks or with a, with a week to pay off something. So fifty dollars for people who are living in poverty becomes that much more uh, difficult. Um, that if it's not paid within thirty days, then it goes up uh, exponentially, and pretty soon we're talking about bills of a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars. I mean, in some ways, it's sort of like a payday loan scam. Right. Where it's like we're going to loan you this money that's going to put you in arrears. You're not going to be able to pay it back because we have such a high interest rate. And then you're going to owe us more money. And then I basically have some type of, you know, some version of an annuity where you have to just keep paying. Is that why? I mean, do you think is it that people living in poverty are targeted because there is an understanding that there's more money to be made there because they can't pay off that first fine and that it just creates a rolling cascading uh, a sense of debt or, you know, notion of debt. Or is it that uh, people living in poverty simply don't have the political um, strength to sort of say, hey, wait a second, this is out of control. Yeah, uh, I, I I think sort of that that last. I mean, some of it is just not thinking. Um, because and and we got to say that there's a racial aspect to this. You know, when when you talk about uh, the rolling. Uh, uh, stop sign. Uh, I write about that in the book. It, it's an, it's an African-American lab, uh, neighborhood. 
um, and and uh, we know that, and we there there was a a, a new thing that just came out yesterday, a new study um, that people who are na- uh, nailed in those kinds of things are disproportionately people of color. So it isn't only a, a sort of clean, if that's the right word, uh, that we're getting this money. I mean, the fact is that they are collecting money for, from people who can pay. And if they were being uh, sort of uh, slightly thoughtful uh, about it, they would stop there. They they would uh, have uh, ways to to have – if you don't have a paper of ability to pay, uh, we'll have community service and so on and so on. Although the better thing would be uh, to just get rid of this these whole incredibly high things, and what we should be doing is what's called taxes. Uh, which we stopped doing uh, so much uh, in state state after state. So what what you're talking about, um, it becomes uh, people are, are swept in, uh, probably uh, in, in an uh, extra uh, amount uh, for for low income people. Um, but in any case, the whole system is just absolutely terrible, and, and we should be cleaning cleaning the whole thing. And in some states, they're beginning to do that. Uh, we've had states just in the last year uh, where they've uh, stopped the uh, – given back the driver's licenses. In, in the state of Mississippi, for example, they gave back uh, – because lawyers were after them uh, – 100,000 uh, driver's licenses were, were given back. And, and in, in California, they've lowered the, the – way they're doing that uh, as well in a number of other states. So people are beginning to wake up to it. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing a, a greater um, a push, too, I think, from some reformer prosecutors in, in states um, uh, to, to diminish cash bail as well. I mean, we had a horrible uh, Khalif Browder in this um Yes. Uh, yes. Ter- you know, terrible story. People, I, I don't know if they remember this story, but um, a, I think he was 16 years old. I, 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 can't, I can't remember how old he was at the time. Maybe not yep. 16. Um, but yep. um, well, he, he's at Rikers and in, in New York, and and uh, he uh, doesn't uh, get bail, and uh, and he ultimately gets out. But by that time, he's very, very mentally ill, and, and he kills himself. Um, and to be so clear, he, he was in he was in jail for three years because he was yes, unable to make uh, bail. Yes, three years. And this Absolutely. is for never supposedly came to never came to trial, and and simply on the accusation that he had stole a backpack with right. um you know a, a yeah. camera a seven hundred dollar camera a, a lawyer thing i have to say <laughs> right. but but yeah the whole thing is absolutely awful but you know bail uh around the country we didn't talk that much yet so if we can get that in please um you have there, there are seven hundred uh thousand people who are in jail around the country uh, uh, every day, uh, and 450,000 of those people are not guilty of anything because they're, they're only in jail because they couldn't pay the money on the bail. Uh, and and that's just you know that's the setup, and we're finally both by legislation and by litigation uh, stopping that in a number of states. Uh, new York State just has a new uh, statute that's terrific. Uh, new Jersey's doing a very good job, and et cetera. And it's just it's just absolutely horrible. The idea that 450,000 right now, as you and I are talking, are in a jail, and the only reason they're there is they can't pay for the the uh, the bail. And then what happens is that the person says, "I got to get out of here. I didn't do anything." But they go to the judge and they say, "I'm guilty. I plead." And then they get out, and then they owe a lot of money, and then the same thing that we just talked about happens. They, they, they can't pay on the payment, payment uh, uh, plans. So um, the, the money bail, it's a bigger problem than, than the fines and fees, but the fines and fees and the bail together, it's absolutely horrible. All right. Lastly, I just want to, because uh, you, you provide some uh, some answers and some solutions at the, uh, at the end of the book, and... Um, it, it it really it wouldn't be that hard to more or less eliminate poverty in this country, would it? 
Uh, we could. Uh, <laughs> we could. Uh, it's, it has to be, if we're going to do it the right way, uh, we've got to have better uh, education for people, low-income people, uh, which tends to be uh, people of color uh, who were parts of the city where the schools aren't so good. Uh, the, the job situation uh, is is uh, not equal, uh, and, and so we have to fix that. Um, but uh, insofar at the very bottom, uh, where we need to have some cash assistance to go with the food stamps, uh, uh, if we had the politics, uh, that part of it, uh, we have the money to do that, and and uh, at least we would have a floor that we don't have. Well, what does it take? Uh, what would it take? I mean, uh, you know, how much um, uh, how much money are we talking about? Oh gosh, just for the b- bottom, uh, I think you could do it for. Um, no, maybe uh, if you doubled, uh, look at it this way. We're we're paying uh, about right now about forty billion dollars uh, for food snaps for SNAP. Uh, so double that. Um, and uh, what you'd get is at least the floor that that people could live. So that part so of just it. Just to be is, clear, just to put that in context for people, we just passed, or a year or two ago, we passed an a increase in um, uh, military spending. Already, obviously, we have spent a huge amount of money on the military, $70 billion a year. So for half that amount, about, if we added that to our uh, anti-poverty measures, um, we would at the very least create a, 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 a you know, a, a floor. I mean, it, it, it's, this is, and, and I don't know how much ink was spilled on the $70 billion increase that we did for a 10 years uh, horizon, at least, on the military budget, not many people even talked about it. <laughs> and right. so, well, and how about the rich people that just got this huge? Of uh, course, gift for, for, yeah. Uh, so just to add that, right? Indeed. Well, um, it's uh, it, it's an important story. We need to be aware of it. I mean, there uh, there are many different um, uh, ways to sort of uh, that we can reform society. Some of that may be uh, coming out in this election. Uh, we'll see. But the uh, if we wanted to end poverty in this country, uh, it's, we certainly could. Of course, it's become the the and I imagine on some level, this is why that criminalization of poverty uh, was was allowed to sort of linger for so long, because particularly when we talk about the 90s, uh, you know, the 80s, the 90s uh, and the aughts uh, and, and even into this decade, the um, the theme of people of of poverty being a function of sort of a uh, a morality or a lack of morality or righteousness, uh, it seems to have permeated the culture. And uh, ho- hopefully we're sort of, uh, re- you know, uh, uh, leaving that era, maybe. I hope so. Uh, I hope we're going to see some uh, results in 2020 uh, that gets more interest. Uh, you certainly see, uh, not that it's perfect anywhere, but uh, in places, uh, California's uh, doing uh, much better, let's say, than Mississippi. Um, and, you know, what we need to do is, is a, a more, uh, even uh, all across the country, uh, so that the red states, uh, at least uh, there'll be some support from Washington. Washington that helps people when their own state uh, is is so uh, not responsive. Not a crime to be poor. The criminalization of poverty in America. Peter Edelman, thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link to your book at uh, majority.fm. Thank you very much. All right, folks, going to take a quick break here. Head into the uh, fun half of the program. Uh, Just a couple of programming notes. Thursday night, we're going to be doing live coverage of the Democratic debate. That will be from 8 to 11 p.m., if I am not mistaken. Uh, We will probably start about uh, 7.45. We will be drinking. And uh, we will, you know, um, as we always do, endeavor to, um, you know, not talk over the important parts of uh, the debate. Um and we should tell you that we're probably going to be streaming on Twitch. And so we will put, um, we'll put a link to, uh, we should start to do that for the next couple of days. We'll put a link uh, to, within the uh, podcast description or our YouTube to our Twitch channel. Uh, so you can just check that out. We're going to live stream it there. 
and um, you can head over there. And uh, if you're a, uh, an Amazon Prime member, and I haven't quite figured this out yet, but my understanding is that you can dedicate a fee that is embedded in your Prime. You don't have to pay anything else. You get, you get like a chit. And each month you can, you can um, designate that chit to us. On our Twitch channel, uh, we'll, we'll get that uh, set up, um, you know, before Thursday night. But um, we will be doing the live debate there. Always fun. Always the highlight of people's debate night is uh, watching us talk about it in real time. Um, just a reminder, it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. When you become a member, you get the show commercial free. So, And also, uh, don't forget, check out the AM Quickie. It's in your feed, in the Majority Report audio feed. Soon we're going to be moving it into its own feed, and we will ask you all to subscribe to push it up the charts, as it were. <clears throat> and just to remind you, you don't want to get stuck in the office looking for the right piece of software. You can do this quick, ladies and gentlemen. Go to Captera. Captera.com slash majority. It has over 950,000 reviews of software in seven over 700 specific categories. You'll have everything you need to make an informed decision about software you need for your business. Also a great way just to browse through and see maybe you want to change a job. Can't believe what's available for people out there. Visit capterra.com slash majority for free today. It's all for free. Find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Capterra.com slash majority. Capterra, that's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash majority. Today is Tuesday. That means that uh, people are going to come and mess up the studio again tonight. I implore all of you to clean up after yourselves. Michael, mm. Jamie, Matt, when you come in here for your gaming sessions. Uh, but what I is going to happen? Here. What, yeah. What's going to happen? Matt has uh, date nights here. It what's, game. Whatever. That's yeah. what I meant by yeah. gaming. Oh. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> nice. The greatest game of all. <laughs> what are you going the to The greatest do? game. The greatest game. What? Tonight, well, first of all, what you should immediately do is go on the majority.fm homepage, buy your tickets to the ne November 23rd Philadelphia TMBS live show. That's the week before Thanksgiving, so don't worry. There's no, uh, I know some people uh, I thought are it was worried about those too. dates, like, but it's not on? Thanksgiving. It's the week before with special guests, Artesia Balthrop, Emma Viglin, and Crystal Ball. They are going fast. Tonight, Kianga Amata Taylor joins us. We are talking about revolution reform, how it fits with the Sanders campaign. Then the rapper Napoleon the Legend joins us and talks about African liberation uh, struggles and how it relates to his music going back to the 70s. Bashkar Sunkara is also here. We're talking about the wave of xenophobic attacks happening in South Africa, how we can chart the failure of the neoliberal ANC in a global pattern of far-right politics and what to do about it, a whole bunch more. Patreon.com slash TMBS, Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, we have on my good friend, Sophie St. Thomas. She's a journalist. She mainly reports on sex and weed which is a pretty cool beat to have, if I do say so myself. Um, I got her take on the famed Alexandra Kolontai essay, Make Way for Winged Arrows. Um, we talked about my trip to L.A. at Tijuana and Joshua Tree and my appearance on Hassan Piker's Twitch stream. That was pretty fun. Um, yeah, check it out. Also, um, next week, I'm going to tease this because I'm very excited about it. We have on Aaron Bastani to talk about his book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. And that is coming out next week. Oh, and I forgot to mention the name of our live show is the Goth Socialist Variety Hour with the Antifada and Pod Damn America. So we're black, folks. Matt. Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. We did uh, The Pioneers uh, by James Sonomar Cooper. The first of the Leather Stocking Tales, where we talk about uh, Natty Bumpo's relationship to the emerging bourgeois state. And the first part is up on YouTube now. So check that out. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. We'll see you in the fun half. Lefty's ass. 
Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice to that. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. My first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. Yes. Good wow. morning, Rebel. Wow, that's crazy. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Uh, Hello. Wow. Uh, uh, um, but hashtag me too. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the number is 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920. We will get to the calls in just a moment. Um, Donald Trump uh, down in uh, a rally uh, uh, supporting Dan Bishop in North Carolina's 9th District. If you're in North Carolina in the 9th District, uh, go and vote, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a low turnout special election, despite the fact that uh, the president comes into town because it activates the Republican voters. And uh, so Democrats have to be activated equally by his existence there. Of course, he came and decried the uh, voter fraud by Democrats in a district that is literally holding its election because of such rampant voter fraud uh, perpetrated by the Republican candidate that um, uh, and this is uh, this is clip number one uh, or is this number two? Uh, this is uh, number one. Uh, here is Donald Trump. Um, this is the Republican playbook. I told you there's two things that the, the Republicans done. They have cut taxes for wealthy uh, uh, millionaires and billionaires, corporations. So regulations can tack on there too. And, um, and they, they have, they have rolled back a lot of regulations that protect people. That is true. Uh, and, and they also uh, are uh, at every moment they can demonizing um, immigrants, refugees, People, brown, black, anybody but white. In fact, sanctuary cities. McCready supports sanctuary city policies that force prisons and jails to release criminal aliens directly into your neighborhoods. Get out, go ahead, go into the neighborhood. Go into, what's your neighborhood? Where do you live? What? Rutherford County. 
Okay. So, how do you feel about having them release hardened, horrible criminals into Rutherford County? I don't think so. But your whole state, it's honestly, can I be honest? It's crazy what's happening. This whole thing with sanctuary cities. And you go to California, which is so many sanctuary cities, they don't know what's happening out there. You have people that want to get rid of those sanctuary cities. They just aren't able to do it with the people that get elected. A lot of illegal voting going on out there, by the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of illegal voting. Yeah, a lot of illegal voting going on out there. Now, as opposed to here, why we're having this special election. Um... This stuff sells. It really doesn't matter what he says to these people. I mean, this is, and I said this yesterday, but we're going to hammer this point whenever there's an opportunity. The Republicans understand there is a finite number of people who will ever vote Republican. That means regular Republican voters and people who, if they vote, will vote Republican. And they basically are activated by the same set of issues. It's just how much the, does it reach them? How visceral is it when it reaches them, particularly those who are less inclined to vote? It's more of a visceral reaction. When Trump goes down there and talks about these same things, it gets their blood boiling. They go out and vote. There's a story uh, in, the, um, in Reuters about the farmers who are getting screwed by Trump's tariffs. We reported the other day that Wisconsin had a record number of delinquent farm loans. Delinquent in terms of payments, which means that they're, they're behind. It's, uh, it's up nationally, but uh, Wisconsin in particular has been hit hard. This uh, Reuters report, instead of directing their anger at Trump, dozens of farmers interviewed by Reuters blasted the U.S. Department of Agriculture and other Washington institutions they believe are thwarting his true agenda. Unsubstantiated conspiracy theories involving USDA staff are circulating in farm country and gaining traction online. Trump voter uh, Brian Hepler, a soybean and corn farmer from Calhoun, Kentucky, said he's open to considering other Republican candidates if they emerge. He said he believes USDA's research methods are flawed and he feels its employees want to unseat Trump. Although he offered no evidence to back up these. Now, it's very possible because they have assaulted the USDA. But understand what the USDA is doing is a function of the Trump administration. And the fact they can't sell their stuff is a function of the tariffs. But that's who we're, we're dealing with, though, when it comes to these uh, Republicans. Um, meanwhile, the big story, John Bolton, gone. Bye. Um, here is Fox and Friends trying to work this out. So This is this, outnumbered, actually. Kilmeade's the outnumbered one. Okay, this is outnumbered. Okay, so what happens is... Um, Why am I morning, outnumbered? I'm, I, there's a lot of other white people here. Oh, the, oh, I got confused. Sorry. There, this morning, it's announced that John Bolton has been fired, right? Did he tweet it out? Did Trump tweet it out first? Uh, let's see. I think Trump, Trump tweeted, tweeted it out, it out first. first. Okay, so Trump tweets it out first. John Bolton Though is Though clearly gone. not Trump. Not right. fun Well, tweet. yes. Somebody, uh, somebody yes. who can uh, put together a sentence uh, tweeted it out in his name. And then, moments later, Bolton, apparently a little bit upset, a little bit upset, said that he offered to resign last night, and President Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. And apparently... After I fire you, was the part that he left out of that sentence. Gotcha. But here is... Uh, it was just like what Abarosa. Yeah. Well, I don't like to hear that. Yeah. Let's check well, on this really tomorrow. That's really horrible. Let's talk about it tomorrow. I mean, look, this is what you do because you don't want to, you want to make sure that they don't steal any pencils. So that's the way that you do that. That's the way the axe drops Trying around to here, too. Sharpies like, out his disgusting mustache. We don't, we don't, want, uh, we, we don't want anybody uh, walking away with a microphone. So it's just like, oh, oh, you're not fired. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And then all the locks are changed. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to, I just didn't want him to take home his mustache grooming kit. I wanted to keep that here. But here is uh, Brian Kilmeade trying to explain this to everyone on Outnumbered. John Bolton just texted me. Oh. Just now okay. he's watching. 
Can you and read it? He, yeah, he said, uh, let's be clear, I resigned. And I said, do you mind if I say that while you were talking? And he wrote, yes. So John Bolton has just told me, texted me, to said, I resigned. Okay. Well, wait so a second. So let me just be clear on what happened. So Bolton says, tweets out in response to Trump saying this, like, I said last night I resigned, then he told me he would talk about it tomorrow. And then probably somebody got to Bolton and said, like, dude, you got to take that back. And so he texts Kilmeade and says, now, okay, now you can say that I, 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 I resigned. I totally resigned. I do like the comedic potential, though, that Brendan pointed to, though, of like, I mean, of course, Bolton said, yes, go ahead, say it. But it is funny of like, do you mind? Yes, I well, do. Well, that's the weird part. Don't, don't, don't right. do it, Brian. Yes, you please idiot. don't. I do mind. <laughs> Seriously. I meant I enough. do mind. I go do. Ahead. Yes, man. Yes, you he idiot. He said, I resigned. Okay. So he answered, yes, yes. go ahead. Yes, not go yes, ahead and I said mind. it because I do not want to say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> For all the obvious <laughs> reasons, right. right? So John Bolton has just answered the president's tweet uh, by saying, why, yes, Why are we doing this? Like, why are we saying, I know why we're doing it. It's a talk show. <laughs> Breaking <laughs> news. But why are they doing it? Why, why are we seeing this play one against the other almost in terms of, you know, what the narrative is? Is it important or is it just that the president has moved on and he's going to hire a new national security advisor? Well, yeah, I'll tell you why we do this, because they're completely incompetent. I mean, it's very simple. This is the 80th time this has happened. Uh, you know, somewhere around like the 10th or 15th time, it became pretty obvious. That is great. Why are We're just we dealing with sheer incompetence. I just don't understand this doing it over Twitter thing. It's very odd. That's, well, is this a new thing? This is so strange. Brian, why are they doing this? Brian, you're an idiot. Like you look so at you it. have the capacity to pretend that this nothing has happened right. before, too. It's right. like you look at your kid's homework and it's like, three times seven equals 28. And you're like, what does this mean? Yeah. <laughs> Why are we doing this? All right, I let's go to the phones. It. Can we just say, though, I mean, very positive news from the perspective of warmongering with Iran and maybe even regime change of Venezuela. And just to underscore two things, this all amounts like Donald Trump has put the whole globe into a tailspin for something that amounts, to, right, the globe, that amounts to absolutely nothing for the past couple of years. And then that he's still better than your average Republican who actually wants war with Iran. Sometimes incompetence, if used properly, I mean, seriously, yep. yes. yeah. if this was Rubio or Jeb Bush, you, you, uh, to a certain Cruz, extent, my God. to a certain extent, it reminds me of the time at Air America when we were in bankruptcy and we had no executives. Like literally it just ran on inertia and the absence of people uh, screwing things up was one of the more successful quarters that we had had. Uh, let's go to the phones. You're calling from a 385 area code. I think it's uh, who, I, I mean, I think you called yeah. yesterday. Is this, uh, is this the guy who <laughs> called yesterday? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, baby. <laughs> Great. He's already the most okay. charming libertarian what, caller what's, ever. What's your, what's your name? Where are you calling from? It, yeah, so it's Josh. I'm from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I, I just got to say real quick, uh, Michael, he said he was going to have a migraine, but I just knew that he loved libertarians so much that he miraculously did get over it before I called in. So yep. that's a good, that's a good. You're handling it better than most so far. All right. So what, uh, what was the, <laughs> what was the point you wanted to, uh, to make? Yeah. Uh, and so basically, so the, the word, the word on the privatized street is that you uh, you like the minimum wage, Sam, and uh, and I, I know I've watched your show a little bit, and yeah, I, I think that you make some decent points. My whole thing with the minimum wage, and the question that I asked you originally uh, yesterday was, why do you want businesses to, to subsidize an individual's bad decisions with a minimum wage? And so that's exactly what it is. Like when you have. A, okay, wait, wait, let me just say, see. Wait, 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 let me, let me just okay. ask you. Uh, okay. Uh, this notion of subsidize, mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure I understand your use of it in that way, but let's put that aside for a moment. What bad decision is it that someone made that they're in a job that. What, what is the bad decision they made? The, that a, sure. you're paying it, they're, they're, they okay. took a job that pays less than minimum wage? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so what? What? Uh, so here's a. Uh, I can't remember exactly uh, the name of the study. You're gonna have to forgive me on that. But 
we take it take it from my word, but there's a study that basically says that in order to have success in America, you have to do three things. You have to graduate high school. You have to not have a child out of wedlock. And uh, I'm having a Rick Perry moment. I can't remember the third one. There's okay. another thing. It's like uh, to graduate high school, um, don't have a child out of wedlock, and get a job. That, that, yeah. So the third one is just get a job. Get so these job. are the minimum. These are. No, no, no. My, these are the. Let me just be clear. Those are the minimum things you need to to what in America? To uh, not be permanently in poverty. Okay. So these the are the, concluded. these, I mean, and study so, shows, and it's not necessarily, so, let me just be clear on what, what the study, the unnamed study is. The, you're saying this <laughs> correlates, it, it's not necessarily causal. I mean, hey, it's a pretty popular study. Ben Shapiro cites it. Oh, well, in that case. Um, many people cite it. Yeah, here, I think we hear, it's the, uh, the Sawhill and Haskins success sequence. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is yeah, an AEI exactly. paper. Okay. Sounds so um, that you need these five rules as a minimum, right? I mean, not everybody who graduates uh -huh. high school or gets a full-time job or gets married before having children and waits at least to get to, to age 21 to get married and wait until at least age 21 to have children. Uh, it turns out there was actually uh, five of them. Um Okay. Uh, but I guess maybe sure. there's there's another AEP paper, a different uh, group that say graduate high school, get a full time job, get married before having children, and that will um, those were those are the success sequences. I'm not quite sure what that means. If that guarantees exactly. it or if that's a minimum, it does guarantee. So that basically means if you do those three, Sam, Sam, if you do those three things, you're not going to be in permanent poverty. And so what you want, unfortunately is you want businesses to step in when people haven't done those three things and you want them to say, all right, well, you've made bad choices. You haven't, you had kids out of wedlock. You didn't graduate high school, but Hey, we're just going to pay you $15 anyway, even though the market doesn't, isn't, that's not exactly what the market would value their labor at. Maybe you would value their labor at 10 or $11. And actually we can talk about how there are very low skilled jobs that pay way more than, than even fifteen dollars an hour that the market's dictated, but but what you want, Sam, is you want businesses, and and in particular, who would hurt the most are the small businesses to subsidize people's bad choices and bad decisions, and that is something I cannot abide by. That well, okay. Um, first off, let's distinguish between what if what if they have you saying that there's no one who graduates high school who has a full time job and who is maybe has no children or hasn't gotten married yet. That they, they don't, so you'd have no problem if someone made all those decisions, you'd have no problem with them with a minimum wage in that instance. Is that your point? Um, at first, I mean, you know, everybody has to start somewhere and then what happens is you gain skill. No, but I'm asking you, you, would you have a problem with the minimum wage if it was only for people that, um, that, that fulfilled the Wilcox and Wang success sequence? <laughs> No, I, I, I would have a, I would have a problem with the minimum wage because on principle, okay, so wait, you so, don't get so, to dictate. Okay, wait, wait. So I'm just trying to get business, to your point here. So it's it's hires, not a just consensual relationship. It's not just it's not just that you think that these people aren't morally deserving of fifteen dollars a minimum or any minimum wage. It's that you don't you have a problem nope. with the government imposing the minimum wage on a business. Uh, yeah. Let's go with that. Okay. Now, all right, so, so let's just stay that because I think the other stuff, I mean, look, the idea that you don't think that they are morally worthy, I mean, I may not subscribe to your sense of morals. And so, you know, then it's really just like, uh, right? Sam, you don't need a straw man to get your point across. Come on. It's not about moral worthiness. Well, that's what I'm, I'm putting that aside. I mean, that, that success sequence, you're saying, why should they be subsidized for making bad choices? That's just your assessment of bad choices. I mean, well, do you have a problem with bankruptcy? Okay, wait, 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 wait a second. Josh, do you, bankruptcy? School, do you have a problem with bankruptcy? Do you have a problem with bankruptcy? Do you have a problem with the concept of bankruptcy? A problem with the concept of it? Yeah. Um, do you know what bankruptcy is? Uh, bankruptcy is when you yeah. have, <laughs> as an individual or as a business, made poor decisions that have led your business to go out to, to uh, be cash poor. Sure. You can't pay your bills, yeah. so you get protection, I don't have and you get bankruptcy. You don't? No, 
Well, I don't understand why. Because because the lenders, the, the, because of the private lenders that gave you the loan for the business shouldn't have. It, it, I mean, that that's what happens sometimes. Is you take a risk. It's not just lenders. Getting a loan at it's a also vendors. Rate. Therefore, it's also vendors. Okay. You get protection well, from vendors. Somebody sells you. Uh, right, you have a. Ahead. You have a. Um, you know. I don't know. Um, you have a, uh, uh, you know, a TV uh, store business, uh, retail, and uh, people sell you the TVs and you don't pay the bill. And then you go into bankruptcy, you get protection from the, from the vendors as well. Okay. So it's not just lenders. It's just people who sell you stuff and you don't, you don't have the money to pay them back. And so you declare bankruptcy. It's not just lenders. Yep. Yeah, sure. Okay. But so why do you think that that's but- okay? Why do you think that bad decision that a business person makes and uses bankruptcy is okay. I mean, I'm willing to dispense with this, but don't pretend you're not making a moral decision about these individuals when you don't apply the same thing to bankruptcy, uh, to discharging debts in bankruptcy. But no, I, I, I don't know where you're, where, where, what you're talking about, to be completely well, honest. Well, you're saying to me is, that if someone makes the mistake, if someone makes the mistake... By not graduating high school or not getting a full-time job or, or, or having children before they get married, that mistake makes them unworthy of, well, ge- of, of okay, getting I, okay, let me, yeah. any type of relief from government. Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, bankruptcy well, does the you, same thing. Well, the, here's the difference, though, Sam. So when you're starting a business, there's no ABC step to have a successful business. In of America, course there is. ABC steps of course there is. In poverty. Of course there is. Of course, there's. It is a you don't think I, you don't think I can find a paper that says here are the five things that you need to do to be a success in business. <laughs> uh, you probably could find that paper, but it's not okay. It's not pragmatic. It's not. Uh, Sam, you can't equate. All right, those let's two just things. move that's on because know, I think that you. you know that I think. Not, you I know think that that's nonsensical. Yeah. Yeah. Sam. Okay, like, Josh. I think so it's I, quite clear that is, that. That Most I was not strong, my uh, straw manning you on that, but I'm willing to move past that because it's clear that you have a, a different set of standards for people who would get uh, the minimum wage oh, than people on. who do use bankruptcy. That's fine. But you have a problem with the government imposing on businesses what the minimum wage would be, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a problem with that. Why? Because uh, you're again, that goes back to the my my question. You know, you're basically subsidizing people's bad decisions. So what happens? What you need to do? So would you have a problem with the government doing it? Would you have a government? Would you have a problem with the government doing it if the workers met your three special requirements from the American Enterprise Institute? Yes, I would because okay. So then you don't have a problem. It's not because they made a bad uh, decision. You have a problem with government, just in general, imposing a minimum wage on uh, businesses. Yeah, well, I have a a lot of reasons for that. It's not just what we were talking about here before. It's also it those minimum wage laws end up hurting the people they're intended to help the most. Well, that's not true. You don't have data Uh, for that. But why don't we stay with one point at a time? Do you think the government has a right to tell a business you must have a minimum wage? Do I, uh, like, does the government have the right? No. No. Do you think the government has a right to say to a business, you must have safe working conditions for workers? Yes. Well, how do you square those two things? Because they're completely separate issues. Because the minimum wage is a consensual agreement between two parties, a business and an in, a independent contractor or a, or a person, I guess. And they're saying, hey, I'm going to do X amount of work, even if it's under $15 an hour, I'm going to complete that labor for this price. Now, when you have safety in the workplace issues, the person might not have known that, that was there was safety issues in the workplace. What if the person knows that it's dangerous to work so, in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, like, uh, on a construction site? Uh-huh. Yeah, anybody can yeah, tell you that it's dangerous right. to work on a construction site. So if he agrees, then we don't need to have any safety regulations. Is that what you're saying? I mean, you, somebody, you're, you're so making a classic so freedom of contract argument to me, and I'm asking why you decide uh-huh. that one part of the compens- uh, compensation package is uh, you can enter freely, but the other you can't. 
Well, we, so do you like think I that said, overtime like, laws be, should exist? Like you don't always know. Do you think overtime laws should color. exist? Do you think? Over- Man, you got to let me finish. You got to let me finish my point. Josh, do you think overtime laws should exist? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, and do you think the child labor laws should exist? Yes, I do. Why can't a parent say to their kids, "You're going to work"? Because when before you're a kid, before you're an adult, you don't your prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. You can't make informed, rational decisions at that point. I'm 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 the kid's parent. Adult, I'm making the decision for them. Well, you can't. They're not your property. You're not your your parents can't make decisions for you as a kid in that what? sense because you're not you're your own human being. You can do whatever you want to do. Is that and, right? Yeah, I nobody nobody's arguing that nobody's arguing that. Uh, that kids are slaves that are, have to do any, anything their parents want. No, it should be illegal because it, like I said, uh, when you, before the age of like 20 years old, let's say, I don't, I'm not a scientist, but let's say before the years of 20, your prefrontal cortex is not developed. You can't make informed decisions. So no, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be able to sign contracts in order to do labor uh, based on, based on that. And so, but but back to the but back to the root of the issue. Hmm. Are you not are you not subsidizing an individual? You, you, you haven't answered the the question because are you not subsidizing bad individual choices by saying, hey, no matter what you do, you're going to get fifteen dollars an hour. How about this, Sam? Do you think that somebody should be able to live in Malibu and uh, and flip burgers as a career? Uh, do I think someone should be able to live in Malibu? I mean, I don't yeah. know. Are there any burger stores and, and in Malibu? Burgers? Do they need to eat burgers? I don't understand. <laughs> I'll be at the Homeowner well, Association well, later. Nice. First, but, I need to but, flip but, some patties. But, but no, that's you guys. That's my entire point. I support yeah, that. That's your entire stores. point. Yes, this I is what we're that. always saying. There are bur- I think people no flip should burgers should be able to live in Malibu and not be able to live in Malibu. I agree with that. Also, when you well, read well, the well, Wilcox me, Lang on. thing, don't you want let to say it in the Borat point. voice? Let me finish my point. Good. Okay. Well, my point with that was, um, yeah. So there are burger places in Malibu, obviously, but the cost of living in Malibu is pretty dang high. Or you can choose San Francisco, or a lot of probably where you're at in Brooklyn. So they're going to pay more money. If there's no minimum, if there's a minimum wage, they're going to pay $15 an hour. If there's no minimum wage, then there's going to be a bunch of people that say, Hey, I can't afford to live in in Malibu uh, flipping burgers. I'm going to move to Texas or something like that. And so since people wouldn't could be, uh, by, wouldn't be employed by those burger joints, they would have to increase their wages. That's why the market is so fantastic because when it, it turns out that people are going to make good rational choices for themselves. Right. And so, but the government coming in and saying, no, it's going to be the minimum wage is going to be $15 an hour. Right. Uh, even in, even, you know, in, in Malibu, well, what's going to happen is the business is going to, you know, I got to be honest with you. I got to be honest with you. To buy Josh, labor. I think it should be higher in Malibu. Yes. I, I think, I think, I think, I think I, I think it should be higher in Malibu. I think 15 as a national uh, wage because that would put it, you know, at least somewhere in line as to where it was relative to uh, productivity and inflation, you know, 35, 40 years ago. Um, and I would say mm-hmm. that in places like Malibu, uh, the minimum wage should be higher. And I think we should allow a place like Malibu to raise. I mean, we do see states. In fact, raise the minimum wage above the federal standards. I don't know if you have a problem with that, with with state governments doing it. I would imagine you do. Uh, But um, and the subsidizing bad decisions, that's just silliness to me because you can't we you and I don't know what the situation of of, uh, those minimum wage workers are or aren't. And certainly you wouldn't want a law that just says only people who do the Wang Wilcox, you know, success sequence are are eligible for a minimum wage. No, I think that the government has a right to do it in the same way they have a a right to regulate other commerce, other aspects of commerce. And uh, I don't know what it means to be uh, if I I I, I don't I, I don't. 
really spend too much time thinking about whether well, burger flippers should be allowed to live in Malibu or not. I'm not sure, uh, you know. But Sam. I just yeah. want to know what it is but, about the private sector that gives them more authority than the state, which is at least hypothetically governed by democracy. Like, why should they get to set people's wages and people's the standards of they're living? They're the ones that, bought, that got the loan to start a business. So, so of course they have more more authority on what on who they can hire and what wage they. they this they, sounds they like a moralistic more argument, but, but on who they can hire, because guess what? You know, newsflash: the government isn't the one that took the risk. Oh, the government! The how did people get to that restaurant the with the burger the flipping? How do they get to the restaurant with the burger flipping? Here we go. <laughs> they they got there on a road. Really on a road, private well, road. I, you know what? But I. Was it a private and, road? And here's where I'll agree. What wait, 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 excuse me. Where, 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 where did, um, what is the infrastructure? How did the infrastructure get there? Uh, that's actually, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you guys are so interested in my tax plan because what I would do if I was president of the United States, I would, I mean, so I'm not, the, the problem with libertarians, uh, I'll say this is a quick caveat. I know you, you need other guests on the show, but yeah. As a quick caveat, the problem with libertarians is that, yeah, there's no really one consensus thing about what a libertarian is. So for me personally, I do think that there should be some income tax. What I And, and, and interesting, what I would do if I were president of the United States is I'd, I would lower the income tax, but I would hike the death tax way up because I, I just think that in this life, what we should get and what we should do, or the fruit, we should get the fruits of our labor. And so I don't think that... that you know, when if you're even if you're a billionaire, a hundred generations down the line, you should your you know your great 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 grandkids should be set for life. I don't think that that's fair. So I think that we should increase the death tax. We should decrease the uh, the income tax and other taxes, and then that we could definitely fund roads and we could fund uh, the necessary functions of of government because there are there is a proper rule of government for sure. Right. It sets up uh, businesses to succeed. Correct? You need to stick, you follow the Wilcox Wang success manual. I mean, the bottom. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, you know, make a baby. I mean, Josh, you go the, to a high the, school. The point is. Yeah, the, you make the, a man. The, the point is, is that um, you, you, um, the the government has the authority to do this uh, because uh, these businesses can't exist without the government and society. And we as a society make a decision, yeah. and it's a political decision. Do we want people to be able, if they are working, full-time job, part-time job, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, um, you know, uh, to get paid per hour uh, if it's a minimum wage situation, do we want them to be able to make uh -huh. a basic subsistence uh, um, uh, salary on this? And the answer is... But they can already do yes. that without a minimum wage. They can already do that without well, a minimum Well, then we don't wage. need a minimum wage, it, and it's irrelevant. Uh, then exactly. in practice, it would be completely irrelevant. So why would you call in about something that's not going to have no, any no, no. implications no, for no, no, anybody? No, no, no. You're misunderstanding me. No, in, in some places you can't. No, like I said, in Malibu... You couldn't live off 725 or whatever the minimum. I don't know what the minimum wage in California is. No, yeah, you're right about that. But that's why you move. Like you can move. Okay, so for example, I was just in Texas. They have a big old. Hi, Josh. Josh. Just Texas. Josh. 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 And you can. Be, you're talking about someone. Dollars an hour to Josh, be a clerk. Josh. So why can't they? Move Josh, how much money do you think? In, in, in your mind, so bad. this guy, this hamburger flipper, how much money do you think this guy has in reserve? So he moves to Texas. He doesn't know anybody in Texas. What happens? Well, he, he gets into don't, his car. Don't cry me a river. You don't know anybody in Texas. People have to move all the time for work. Josh, also, Josh, wait like a second. Hold on for you? a second. Hold on for a second. Josh, I want you to walk through this with me. Yeah. How much money does that guy have in the bank? Uh, he can definitely save. He can save money up. At seven dollars so and we'll a say, quarter. We'll he's, we'll living, he's, he's living in Malibu. He's living in Malibu. A thousand dollars to. Now you know the statistics okay. that over half of uh, uh, of the country can't raise four hundred dollars uh, in an emergency, right? Well, thank you for proving my points because they make bad decisions with their money. So, okay. Yeah, exactly. So. All right, Josh. Thank you for proving my point. Josh, what you're talking about is a fantasy. It is you. You cite Ben no, Shapiro. Not. You you're basically talking about Ben Shapiro's like notion of like if they live on the coastlines and their place is going to get flooded, they could just flip their house. I mean, 
you, well, no, dude, the different, the different. Dude, you're Stanford not in reality, and it's and what's you, know what's, you know what's depressing. You know what's depressing though, legitimately. Like, you know what's? Oh, wait, 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 hold up. You can go back, and we can do this another ten minutes. But I have to just editorialize. I, you are not in reality. If somebody's making seven fifty yes, an hour, no, you're literally not. If somebody does not have the okay. capacity to save. Because their actual wages do not cover any of their immediate expense or all of their immediate expenses, then they cannot save. In fact, that's math. And what I find really disturbing is that if you're in a fantasy life, why don't you at least have a constructive and positive fantasy life for people actually having a better, a better scenario? <laughs> because you're literally, you're well, in a okay, fantasy. So basically, you're, you're in a fantasy. Can I, can I say something now? No, dude, you got to explain okay, how so you're not in a fantasy because these are tiresome hey, for us. On, yeah, at least speaking, for me. Of, speaking of okay, fantasy so versus reality. Come on, let me, let, me, let me talk, let me talk. So basically what you guys are saying is that they can't, my plan or whatever, however you want to phrase it, no. isn't going to work because they can't drive to Texas. They can't afford driving to Texas. Well, they don't have That's a car. I don't know if they have money for a car. They don't have money to put down uh, for a, an apartment. Like I don't know where well, they're going to live. in Malibu, I would assume they have a car because there's the public oh, transport is pretty God. bad there. Dude, so there's nobody there living. You know what? And if you're so Josh, anxious you're about... No, no, let Malibu. me just say, if you are so anxious about somebody living in Malibu making a poverty wage... You can totally it's let that example. go because nobody's living in Malibu with a poverty wage. It's a dumb example. It's man. a stupid, ridiculous example. That's and we're not, not even getting, And I will That's make a moral, and I will make a moral right. claim. I think it's wrong that people should have to move on a whim every couple of months just so they can survive. There's no reason we need to maladjust no, resources that way. Months. It's Start delusional. Your, your I was talking about You're wrong on the math and the morals, bro. Yeah, so you use Texas as an example. I'm looking at a map right now. There's nowhere in Texas where you can afford a one-bedroom apartment uh, on working 40 hours a week at minimum wage. And there's almost nowhere uh, in the well, country and, where you can. So wait, what about? No, that's not true. That is not true at all. All right. Well, listen, I, 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 I don't right. want to get into right the now. arguments about what the cost of living is in, in Malibu versus Texas and whether there's, whether this fantasy get, f hamburger you can flipper get, you can, can get, get into good, a car. But, Josh, the bottom line is this. Look, like listen, six just seven, suck. Dude, dude, like, listen, if I went through, Josh, and start to pick apart your life to see what decisions you have made that are bad. And decided that because of that, you should not be worthy of whatever you get. Do you have a home? Do you have a mortgage interest deduction? Do you own your own home, Josh? Uh, no, not right now. Not right now? No. I don't think you should be able um, to eat after making you, this call, I mean, Josh, honestly, uh, like, like I, I have a feeling that if I was to comb through there, I would find a moral reason to deny you, if I wanted to, some basic uh, subsistence. But, wait, wait, you don't have but, a house and you have time no, to call but, but a show my, in the but, middle of the but you day? Guys, okay, I think, well, I think maybe I've done a bad job of, like, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to people. Like, I definitely think that you shouldn't, like, obviously, you don't want to be living off of $9 an hour. Nobody would argue that. But it's your, it's uh, your what decision. I'm saying is you're not helping people by by having these minimum wage, quote unquote, living wage uh, situations where they can they can just get by. You want people to thrive, not just survive. Right well, now you're making well, a whole other Josh, argument. Josh, what, Josh, what I, first of all, first of all, anybody, anybody who has had any, better anybody venture. who has had any success would never say that. The, that I'm in a better position to have success if I'm making $9 an hour than I am making $15 an hour. Because $15 well, an hour gives no. you a breathing space to take more risk you know, in your fantasy world where all it takes is just but, some gumption and you can succeed in order to buy the seat, in order an to buy a copy, you more, more, more opportunity to take risk. Everybody knows this. That's why Josh you're, you know, like, and I don't know, I, I mean, maybe this is a guess, but I imagine that you came from a decent family that has a, a decent amount of, of money and opportunity. I'm sure you've worked your way up uh, the ladder, but it was always nice to have that, that safety net of your family. Oh, yeah. Right. There's hey, other I'll people who that. don't yeah, have that. There's, yeah. right. Bad, there's bad other people yeah, who I don't have that. Who, there are other people who don't have that. that and even if your folks yeah, had but, not given you an extra buck, the fact that you had that safety net meant that you could take more risks than someone who, if they stumbled 
end up having no safety net. And you need to start appreciating that, Josh, because when you do, when you start to reflect on what your advantages, even if they aren't direct, even if they're just in the back of your mind, have, have contributed to your success, you need to contemplate, what if I didn't have that? What if my family did not exist, yeah. and if I was on the streets, you're weren't to there? Because yeah, I'm appealing to emotion. Came from nothing. Yeah, I'm appealing to emotion because we're human beings. And the fact of the matter is okay. that you would not make the same set of decisions if you didn't know that if you faltered, you had a backup plan that had nothing to do with you, but had to do with your family. But also, no, no, he's what I mean, he's so, doing is he's articulating Rawls, okay. which is the most basic moral liberal. For, there's nothing radical about it. If you spent less time like reading silly Internet threads and read some intro to moral uh, political philosophy. On. No, I'm serious. This is Rawls's thought experiment that and you should love it. It's a thought experiment. How would you design a society from scratch if you didn't know where you were in it? That's the opening question. That's it. It's Josh, not complicated. Yeah, I want appreciate know the call. If you've we ever get, supported get, yourself on a minimum wage job. We all know the answer to that. Um Yeah, well I With no help I've from never, anyone. I've thankfully I've gotten good enough jobs. <laughs> I mean I have worked minimum wage jobs before. I'm not gonna lie to you and say you I've had backing. supported myself. Yeah. I just like to point out that the AEI is backed off of this success sequence nonsense. But you Even guys recently, are, but, but, but the problem. Oh, wait a second. Uh oh. Late saying, breaking. So, yeah, so we have a late hey, breaking. So problem. This, you're appealing to emotion. Let me appeal to the hey, American Enterprise Institute. Hold on. Josh, we got some late breaking uh, facts. We got some late breaking yeah. facts on your no, AEI success uh, sequence. What happened to so it? So they've uh, backed off the correlation and causation thing of like, you can just do this as a get out. Of, so here's a choice phrase. Looked at this way the elements of the success sequence are less the cause of a good life than markers of such life already underway so structural things like being able to finish high school for instance means that you already have a life that can get you through high school and there are certain things like and talk about like moving across the country financially speaking if you're like uh like family becomes much more important when you're uh poor so like just be having to move across the country get this is why we were saying you are not in reality pal and let's read John, John, read John Rawls and, and put down people are disincentivized from getting Josh, married because think, they lose wealth. I think we've given you a lot of time. But, uh, read so. some John Rawls instead of the secret, bro. I, like Bye. Last word. Final word. Final word. Final word, Josh. Go. Is a safety net. Final word. Yeah. All right. All right let me. All right. I'm gonna, let me call back again sometime. I'd love to, to continue. The of course, anytime, but, uh, Josh. I, appreciate I, I the call. Love, anytime when Sam's okay, hosting. Okay. I take it you guys. I take it. You're I not welcome. You guys won't be ver- voting for Vermin, Vermin Supreme this upcoming election. Uh, if there's anything that has to do with the Libertarian candidate, it'll be for me. I if, appreciate if, the call. If Yomar had a minimum wage, I would oppose it for you, John. I do love Vermin Supreme, though. Met him a few times. He's pretty cool. You're delusional, man. <laughs> um, you are so delusional. Just move. Why can't your delusions be pleasant? Good news, ladies and gentlemen. Donald Trump has promised that he's going to release... <laughs> extremely complete financial statements before the next election. It's, you know, like I have all these stories that come across that like Mnuchin today, who talked about tax cuts for 2020. It is, they're just throwing everything at it. Do we have free runs? Well, we're going to get more tax cuts and we're finally going to re- repeal Affordable Care Act 2020 if I get reelected plus my full financial statements. I haven't found out other than when a plane stops at a massive international airport and gets fuel. I don't own the airport. Pause it. When pilot- now, incidentally, he's what he's responding to is the fact that um, they've been using all of his like resorts as uh, basically stopovers. And he made a deal in Scotland, apparently, to reroute planes to get the you know, U.S. You know, it's all emolument stuff. It's for security. Yeah, totally for security. My security. <laughs> Financial security. Good. Stay, I own a lot of different places. Soon you'll find that out when I because I'll be at some point prior to the election. I'm going to be giving out a financial report of me, and it'll be extremely complete. I'm going to give out, I'm going to give out my financial condition, and you'll be extremely shocked that the numbers are many, many times what you think. I don't need to have somebody take a room overnight at a hotel. So, 
<laughs> yeah. Like it is like he might actually be finally making some real money. Because my guess would be was that uh, his his wealth was uh, literally aspirational on some level, like in the sense in his head. And I think now after a couple of years in the presidency, he might I'm be making some it. real I'm totally cash. feeling it. Um, Laura Ingram, getting back into the mix. She's been out of the news for a while uh, and um, she sees an opportunity. This is uh, maybe she's like going to get her own Kaepernick story. Um she has Ben Watson on. Um, he's from the Patriots. And uh, Watson um, basically uh, is arguing, it's based on this uh, piece that was written by Jamel Hill, um, that it's time for black athletes to leave white colleges because we do have a system where, you know, and you, college students, college athletes don't get paid. Pay them. They generate so much money. For these institutions, that it is stunning. If you look at who the highest uh, state employee, paid state employee in a lot of states, it's the football coach. It's the football coach. But the players don't get play, don't don't get anything. They, you know, they get like I saw something that Lowe's was giving out a lawnmower to a guy, to a kid. That was the Carolina kid, Panthers. As it, as it, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Carolina Panthers the gave out. Yeah, they gave out a lawnmower from Lowe's to a kid who's trying to raise money for college. Um, and somebody did the, the math, like wow. the kid would need to like mow 3,000, 3,500 lawns to, you know, pay for a uh, state school. And, you know, the bottom line is, is like, this is out and out incredible exploitation. And it's very hard to look at these teams and say, hey, this is, there's a, there's a sort of tinge of racial exploitation here too, maybe. Uh, we're going to go to um, uh, areas where uh, maybe there's a, a decent amount of, of poverty. And this is their one ticket out. This is their one ticket out. Um, and so uh, the idea that, yeah, of course, student athletes should be paid and they should be unionized just like professional athletes, because they're professional in every way except for the fact they don't get paid. They are creating value. Without a doubt. Extraordinary value. And they pay them, and then they can pay their tuition. How's that? And they should have a lot more left over based upon what they generate. But here is the, the debate. Like, how dare these people? Reaction. Uh, to the story we covered last week, where former ESPN anchor Jamel Hill created a kind of stir with a piece uh, in The Atlantic where she argued that black athletes should stop attending white majority colleges. What's your reaction to this? Well, I read the article, and, and, and when I saw the, the uproar over it, I read the article, and, and I agree with her. Uh, she had some great points in that article. When you look at the history of HBCUs and you look at the, the, the hundreds of thousands of, of, of black professionals that have come from these schools over the course of, of uh, the last several years since they've been created, and you look at what's been lost since, um, since integration has happened, what she was saying was simply that athletics is a multi-billion dollar business. I went to two historically white universities, Duke University and University of Georgia, that have a lot of money based on athletics. What she was saying that, look, we, we're living in a time where there's a big racial wealth gap. The average white family has a net income, a net worth that's 10 times that of a black uh, family. And so if we're able to have some of these athletes that create so much uh, uh, income go to some of these schools, uh, not that white students don't go and students of other ethnicities don't go. We live in a time where everybody can go wherever they want to. But what she was saying simply, if we're, if we're trying to pump money and revenue into some of these communities that there's still this big disparity this may be a way to do it obviously that's in a vacuum yeah. there are other other factors to figure <laughs> it, it into that but when you read her argument yeah. um look she, she she lays it out very very cleanly and, and it's actually yeah. uh, something that, that i agree with pause it for All one right. second i have two things to note right here one benjamin watson my new favorite patriot uh a b you can look at the look on, on laura ingram's face going like why the hell did we book a football player who's going to sit here and completely uh, make this so obvious as to why this should happen? I thought we were getting a football player here so that I could look like the smart one. Yeah, some extra context on that is they thought Ben Watson would be more of a conservative because he defended uh, Drew Brees' relationship with Focus on the Family. Ah, okay. And so they thought... All right, yeah. so, wait, so let's hear what uh, Laura Ingram has to say. And, and it's actually yeah. uh, something that, that I agree with. All right, Benjamin. Well, I think that 
Duke would have not been thrilled about your not being there. But let's, let's, uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I mean, the, the, the college sports would certainly be a lot different today if, that, if, that, if we went down a color-coded way of well, figuring out well, college admissions. I mean, that's, like not, that's resegregating the well, country. Why well, do we want that? Well, no, because segregation, as you know, is, is government mandated. Yeah, I get this it. Is, I get this it. is not segregation. Yeah. This is, if, you, if you read the article and, and see what you're I get it. You faced me. I read the article. All right, yeah. we got to go. Ben. Yeah, there you go. Wow. So, that is and, not and I want to make it clear, incidentally, the, when you're talking about a university like Duke or, uh, or Georgia, the hundred guys who may be on a football team, I don't think you're going to be a deseg- you're, you're going to be segregating the schools if those 100 athletes or 50 or however are, are African-American on that team go to a historically uh, black university. I mean, in many respects, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, one, these, these athletes should be paid as professionals, but if they're not, at least put it into a uh, a school that is going to uh, serve, um, you know, underserved communities, and provide more scholarship and uh, scholarship money and uh, uh, become more competitive. I mean, the it's the uh, it's it's a great idea. This really illustrates why, despite what Candace Owen says, there's really no home for black people in the Republican Party, right? Like he's a black conservative, but they just cannot. Like there's just too much stuff where they're just talking completely different. Well, there's languages. no That's home. That's I mean, stunning. There's no home for uh, Artesia and I were talking about like for a person of color who might just be like a normal conservative. Exactly. You have to be like, you know, actually the KKK is either well, well yeah, they're either Democrats. You I have mean, to be a like disingenuous, a a total crackpot. You can't just be like. Hey, you know, I'm a little bit of a. Do you know how mad guy. Laura Ingram was with her producers after that segment? We've heard how mad she can get with her. Producers. Do you know how mad she is with? Do you those, remember those that producers? clip? Oh yeah, a couple was, years she ago, yeah. she freaked. Oh out. yeah, she freaked out at some people. How did you not do a pre-interview with him? How did you not do a pre-interview with him? And if he lied, he's never coming back on this show. Because she had nothing. She had no response. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> I got hoodwinked, she's thinking. We've got to find a new black athlete to come on and criticize this idea. It's segregation all over again. Oh, he just so you know, politely. Because, you know because of the weeks-long specials she's done on segregation and education in this country and how much she's, she is really, really fighting against it. Yeah, Laura really fucking Barbie. cares about that. <laughs> Laura Ingram is she because she hates it because... Or resegregating, and she just wants to be in a rainbow. And she hates and that. And she hates that. She hates that tremendously. That's why she wrote Let's, about the Obamas so much. Let's talk about this Think Progress thing for a while, because this is really upsetting to me, actually, on some level. Um, look, the Center for American Progress, back in 2004, when this thing was launched, I don't know when they were launched. Was it 2003, 2002, 2001, somewhere around there? Um, you have to understand that there was very little infrastructure left of center at all. Left of center at all uh, back at that time. And, uh, but even at that time, people would talk about it. Some people there too. It was like the Clinton administration in exile. And at one point, Center for American Progress realized, like, oh, you know, so much of this is happening online. We're going to create Think Progress. Very helpful tool for someone in my business. Um, there just wasn't the resources that we have today. And you had staff who were going out there and they were um, digging up stories, finding stories, reporting on stories that you just wouldn't see in the mainstream press. And some very good people came out of there. Amanda Turkle uh, started her career there, I believe. Um, who else? There was, um, uh, what's that? Uh, uh, Milheiser, uh, David Sirota was a cap. I think he wrote for Think Progress a little bit too, actually. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it has become a little bit less relevant uh, as the years have gone by because there's a lot more competition. And to a certain extent, um, 
ideologically, they ended up uh, not moving as much with the rest of the, uh, I think, the, the, the times on some level. In some areas, some areas not. But uh, still did some good reporting. They unionized. And back when they unionized, uh, in 2018, I think it was, uh, let's look at this. Even near Tandon. Oh. Oh, different unions. Well, they unionized at one point. I can't remember when it was. Uh, but um, here's near Tandon back in the day talking about uh, unions because, of course, look, um, E.J. Dion's talking about um, some race, and near Tandon makes the point maybe people are waking up to the fact the best way to raise wages is stronger unions, which is, I think, a fairly standard conventional uh, wisdom within the Democratic Party. Largely, whether they will actually carry through at times is another question. But that understanding, I think, is uh, is certainly not controversial in the Democratic Party. The, the reality is also equally uncontroversial. There's just very hard data that shows the existence of union raises wages across the, the, uh, the, the, the whole industry. Uh, Dave Weigel had a tweet about something about support for the uh, Nissan union drive in, uh, in uh, Mississippi. Was this in uh, it didn't, it, I don't think, I don't know if they unionized at that point, but, um, near attendance says this union drive is important for people who care about wage growth. This is critical. So the other day it was reported that, um, I think progress was closing. Their funding had basically, uh, dry, uh, dried up. Um, again, they were not, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of redundancy now because you have a lot of other, um, uh, outlets that, that followed this news social media, whatnot. And then it became clear within a couple of days they were going to relaunch Think Progress. And not only that, they were going to get rid of the archive of all the work that the people who had done there did, which was evergreen work about various issues, climate change, the law, um, you know, regulatory schemes. I mean, all sorts of different stuff that was very good, sort of like, down the middle, as it were, uh, reporting on this stuff. That is the nuclear option. And on top of that, yes, I mean, it happens all the time with the uh, supposedly less reputable outfits. On top of that, they, were, they had, in like a five-page memo, announced to people who were subscribing to Think Progress that if you email us, we will, we will stop taking your payments. <laughs> In other words, you've got to opt out. Now, I will tell you this. Because I'm smart. I will tell you this. For a long time, I wouldn't even take year-long um, uh, memberships to this show because I was like, I don't know if I am going to continue to do this. You know, early on, I wasn't sure if it was going to make it. For like a first year or two, I wasn't sure. Like, I could close up shop in a month. And if people are just doing monthly, I can end it. And just shut it down. Uh, and I was like, but I wouldn't know how to, to re refund the year-long memberships. The idea that you would do this is, it's despicable. It's despicable. And so um, the Think Progress Union um, put out a, a statement yesterday on Friday. This was on last Friday. The Think Progress, uh, Center for American Progress laid off the entire Think Progress newsroom. The Think uh, Progress Union is devastated, um, but incredibly grateful for the solidarity from our industry colleagues and Think Progress alums. Thank you. Because of the strength of the union, we were able to secure 12 weeks of severance pay, health insurance through the end of the year, 11 unit members who lost their jobs. Additionally, we were able to secure half the year end revenue bonus promised in our contract, and we remain in talks to secure the full amount. However, we're blindsided by the revelation that CAP continues to operating the Think Progress site with its own labor Scabs. and use the Think Progress social media accounts to promote that work. Our editorially independent unionized labor powered impactful journalism to Think Progress to take away our independent voice and use the wide audience built by Think Progress union staff for other purposes is an affront. We ask that the CAP management keep Think Progress alive as an archive site but not co-op the site for non-editorially independent analysis and articles. Additionally, we are gravely concerned about CAP's announcement on Monday. They will not be halting recurring donations from Think Progress members. Instead, they're requiring those to uh, proactively opt out. 
Cap has repeatedly said the decision to shut down Think Progress was a financial one made in light of larger industry struggles, but Think Progress was not founded to be profitable. We know that this was never about money. This was always about power and control. We're exp um, exploring our legal options. It's been reported that they are going to close down the, um, the donations and that they are going to archive the site. Um, I also think, frankly, that even if they continue on with the Think Progress as an entity, with non-unionized people, that they're going to run into a National Labor Relations Board uh, problem. That this could be a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. And, but more than this, more than everything I've just said, and even more than what it says about the, the values that they operate under, because they clearly do not walk the walk on the values that they espouse. I mean, it's just stunning. But how stupid are these people? How stupid are these people? I mean, well, are you serious? Are you serious that you thought you could get away with this? Like in what universe? Like with all due respect to Neera Tandon, are you serious? How, what, for one second, did anybody think like, oh, nobody's going to notice <laughs> that we're basically using scab labor and we've just basically violated the National Labor Relations. None of the people <laughs> who follow what the Center for American Progress would ever notice this. I mean, how the level of incompetence here. I'll tell you something. If I was a funder for the Center for American Progress right now, you know what I would be doing? I would be shopping around for a center for another American progress because this one may be part of the reason why we're not having uh, uh, experiencing progress at the moment. I would well, say if you were if you were a if you were a, total if you are a, a monthly that, that, donor, you would be doing that. If you were like, as an example, the uh, government of the United Arab Emirates <laughs> or Pfizer or Exxon or any number of financial services firms. You might be really digging it. You'd be golf club. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, you know, that's actually really cool. I just tell they're Democrats and they just violated the entire labor relations board. That's pretty cool. There are By the way, Tom people. Daschle is on the board of, uh, you know, I, I don't even remember all there, the There should be people quitting. There should be people resigning from this board now. Yeah, I mean, they I, won't, I would but. be surprised if anyone is still giving them money because they think they believe in progressive values. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it, you, you may be right about that as well. I mean, but uh, this is, I mean, they're done. I mean, honestly, you stick a fork in this because no, this is just, how bad, how bad at this do you need to be? Well, what else are they showing for a return on investment on how, like, what do they get, 40 million a year? Or something I, like I have no idea. But I mean, like, just come up with a different name for the organization. Tuck it in the corner. We're calling it, um, you know, wait. Wait a year. We're, we're reintroducing Think Progress. We hired one reporter with a union salary and the rest are going to be, whatever it is. Like, even the most cynical person would be like, oh yeah, no, we're not going to get away with this. I would be more surprised at this point if Neera Tandon didn't pull some crazy crap like this. But also, I'm sure she's going to find a way to twist this around and say that anyone who's mad about the union thing and the scabs is just attacking a woman of color out of bad faith. That's right. It's Bernie's fault. Let's face it. All you bros. <laughs> Definitely Bernie's <laughs> it's fault. Bernie's fault. Yeah. Getting everybody all riled when up you about you. see unions. all of these toxic Bernie supporters online and they're harming an august liberal institution. Unbelievable. Really shocking. Um, and they did, all right. which is why I don't care that any. They of them literally were fired. did say that. Yes. Nira's just see, mad. None of the writers. Bernie's sitting there like there is one candidate who might be a little bit more sympathetic to your plight. The same one you were bitching yeah. about owning houses, you idiots. I think Nira's just mad. None of the writers came to her, her defense whenever she gets ratioed on Twitter. It's like what 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 good are you people? It's very possible. Um, it is a very weird thing for them to have done, but I I, I mean. It is what it is. Um, all right. Lastly, let's go to this um, this new ad. 
Maybe we'll do the, uh, should we, I don't know if I want to play any clips of Tulsi and uh, is there anything? Well, well, we'll see. Um, so this is uh, an ad. Valerie Plame, do people know who Valerie Plame is? She was the uh, CIA agent. I mean, the, uh, I certainly I do. We talked about it quite a bit back in the day. Uh, she was a CIA agent who was outed by the uh, Bush administration as a way of punishing her husband, um, who was a um, was a, an envoy, a former ambassador, uh, who was sent to, I think it was Nigeria, to examine the uh, u- uh, yellow cake uranium story that they had sent to um, Sa- to um, to Saddam Hussein in the run-up to the Iraq War to prove that there was a reason for us to go into a- the Iraq War. Um, when... Um, when her husband came back and said and went public essentially with the the fact that there was no and this is after the launch of the war um her husband joe wilson who was a former ambassador i can't remember from where um basically made it public that they were desperately trying to um to make it seem like uh iraq was a genuine threat to us um and after that there was some controversy with Valerie Plame. Well, let's play this. Um, here it is. I was an undercover CIA operative. My assignment was preventing rogue states and terrorists from getting nuclear weapons. You name a hotspot, I lived it. Then Dick Cheney's chief of staff took revenge against my husband and leaked my identity. His name? Scooter Libby. Guess who pardoned him last year? I come from Ukrainian Jewish immigrants. Dad was in the Air Force. My brother almost died in Vietnam. My service was cut short when my own government betrayed me. We left Washington to raise our kids in New Mexico, one of the best places on earth. Now I'm running for Congress because we're going backwards on national security, health care, and women's rights. We need to turn our country around. And yes, the CIA really does teach us how to drive like this. You've probably heard my name. And Mr. President, I've got a few scores to settle. Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, that's an incredible ad. <laughs> I'm with her. I, I, you know, like, um, no, it's like you're with her, except she's hot. I can understand that you need an ad to just sort of break through the noise. This doesn't seem to promote many policies other than it seems like, um, freeway, uh, freeway driving. I mean, what we really need right now is to beef up the security state beyond what it already is. The one good thing it does is it ties Trump to the Bush administration and Republicans in general. But other than that, like, yeah, the, I mean, I like that part of it. And she also uh, made a point of saying that she had, um, uh, uh, Jewish ancestry because of, there was a little bit of a, of a anti-Semitic, uh, tweet, uh, situation back in the day. That she uh, quickly backed off, I think, two hours later or something. Some some story she had... Uh, Jews caused the wars. But <laughs> but you can't blame her for that. I asked Alan Dershowitz once. I said, why did the Jews cause the wars? Fascinating guy. I mean, I think we, we were seeing... You know, we saw there's like Amy McGrath when she ran for Congress too, right? In in Kentucky. Oh, where she it is. was like... There, there's just like this using of like the sort of the military, the national security state and sort of like, um, you know, um, it, you know, it's a way of, that, of, of, of women to project that they're like strong and man. Definitely. Look, look at me. But did that also really start? I mean, it wasn't that very accentuated. I mean, Rahm Emanuel's whole 2006 house strategy was get vets. Yep. Get, get like that whole like. Well, people, these are yeah. people coming back from the war in Iraq. Well, who, no, I mean. Uh, to be clear, my problem is definitely not with vets, but it wasn't these people have a firsthand consequence of the wars. It was don't even talk about Iraq, literally just show off some type of pedigree and do ads where you're in a plane and show that you're tough. Well, I mean, people- Rom, Rom explicitly said in 2006, I'm sure people ignored it, but his directive was 
not even to have a position for or against just right. don't discuss. But I think I think there was I think there was I mean a lot of those vets were talking about Iraq at the time when they come out because a lot of that that, that was when you know that was the supposed anti-war uh, election. But not um, from Rom. I mean, I just reread his stuff. In, I don't uh, doubt in, uh, it. Grimm's I mean, he was book. bad R- about Grimm. all of it. Yeah. Well, Rom supported it, and what his his olive branch was: don't talk about it. We got to talk about prescription drugs. Right. Two thousand six is about prescription drugs. <laughs> an idiot. But there it is. All right. All right. I'm going to do a thirty second thing. If you've been hanging on the phone for longer than. For 29 minutes or more, uh, I will get to you. If, if it's been less, sorry, folks. Uh, let's go to the phones. Call from a 479 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Joe from Arkansas. Joe from Arkansas. Uh, what, what's on your mind, Joe? Straight away, I'm going to apologize for the last call because it was a little, I made a, you know, borderline anti-Semitic uh, impersonation of you. Oh, well, that's all right. Everyone Michael does that every day. Funny, it's just but, so you know, fine. Matt was right. You know, people in Arkansas doing Sam Cedar impersonation is probably a good thing. Yeah, but, I think it's, uh, it's nice. Well, what, so what else is on uh, mind? Go. Oh, my God, my back hurts. I'm Sam Cedar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, uh, there was an awesome TYT clip about a week ago on my congressman, Steve Womack, in the 3rd District of Arkansas. Which is uh, uh, it's a pretty wicked place. It's the home of Walmart and Tyson Foods. But uh, he was here at a town hall, and he got uh, booed pretty profoundly for saying that gun violence was because uh, there wasn't enough God, and then he blamed single mothers after that, which was pretty awesome. Sounds like the caller from earlier. Right. Um, did no, anybody no. point out that, that, um, that uh, his concept of God was a function of a single mother? Ooh. Well, I don't know about I mean, that, but I, not enough folks I, are... I about lost my top earlier with with the whole libertarian caller because uh, I'm not even going to get into it. I just, I, I, I just want to thank Michael right off the top for telling him that he is in a fantasy world because that's where that dude lives at, is right. in a fantasy world. And not a nice one. Not a friendly fan. No, it, it's not even a good one. And he said, if you're, you know, he said people make good, rational choices if left to their own, but then he called the majority report to make that asinine argument. So. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I appreciate the call, Joe. That's a good one. Joe keeps coming through. That's good. All right, we're going to do uh, 30 seconds here. Call from a 360 area code. Who's this? Where you calling from? we got 30 seconds. Go. Yeah, this is Matt from Washington. Go, Matt. So, So I'm calling to find out, like, about the trade war. Trump keeps insisting that the Chinese are stealing our IP. Now, from what Dr. Richard Wolff says, Richard Wolff says the Chinese view it as the deal since the inception of all free trade between China and the U.S. is that the deal has always been their cheap labor for our IP. But I can't exactly find that on the Internet just myself because I'm not that Internet literate. I'm wondering, how does that all work? And is Dr. Richard Wolff right? Oh boy, I don't know. I don't have that at my fingertips. Dr. I don't know. Wolf. I have a feeling. My guess is that was more of a uh, unspoken understanding um, that uh, you know. People like Thomas Friedman basically say that yes, that like there was like when it came to there was there was stealing IP and boot like you know hey you can bootleg uh, you can you can sell knockoff DVDs or Nikes but now this is about the future of IG or 4G or whatever so. That is the Richard Wolf point. I think it's true, and I think he's right that there is a huge amount of U.S. corporate hypocrisy. Look at Sam. He's finding China on the globe. I uh, appreciate the call. It is a nice-looking globe. Calling from a 307 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Antonio from Wyoming. And what's on your mind? 30 seconds. I'm calling just – I'm trying to get the word out about um, the work that's, that's happening out here in Wyoming. The what? People probably wouldn't believe it, but you know the work happening in Wyoming uh, for immigrants. There's a we've been fighting a campaign for two years to try and stop a private prison from being built out here. Um, it'll be a 500 bed facility. We're just trying to get the word out that there's people here fighting in Wyoming and. 
fighting hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. What? Tell, uh, so tell, is there a please. website that we can go to, or uh, where can we get more information? Yeah, yeah. Um, Yo say no. W Y O say no dot com. W Y O on there. Check out everything. Say no. Yeah, yeah. Dot com. And living in a libertarian state, I love those videos of you eating those dudes up, man. <clears throat> oh well, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, good luck. What? What? Um, <laughs> uh, all right, we have it here. You need a county. Uh, Yo say no. We will put a link yeah. to this uh, in our podcast uh, description and um, and check it out. Keep on fighting the good right fight. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for your efforts. Heck appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye. Calling from a 607 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? you got 30 seconds. Hello, this is uh, Clay from Athens. Clay from uh, Athens. In, in, in- Yes. In, you got- in regard to your pre- previous caller, the libertarian, um, you know, it seems to me that, it uh, again, the sides are drawn between the, those who believe that uh, uh, the poor are poor because it's their own fault and those of others of us who believe the poor are poor because of uh, systemic impoverishment. And um, not to uh, trot out my crackpot ideas, but I've been perusing uh, uh, Piscavana, uh Nominate by uh, Grishowitz and West, and they say the central message of modern socialism at this stage of industrial uh, 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 at this stage of industrial development is that the hard fact is every year there's going to be more people and proportionately fewer jobs. Right. You know this well, is the legacy. Of the yes. All right, got to go. Appreciate it. That was 50. I gave you an extra 20 seconds. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Well, you get- oh. I think he was going to say you gave that idiot 20 minutes. Libertarian? Well, yeah, yeah he was he just was up at the top. But we the all show. know that. This- call him from a, yeah, we all know how it works around here. Call him from a 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 610. Yes. Philadelphia, me. Uh, let's see. Uh, concerning your main topic today, uh, up to a few weeks ago, Philadelphia was releasing people after hours that uh, the place where they were handing over their goods and valuables, uh, like wallet, ID, etc., were uh, that office was closing I, at I'm sorry, uh, 4 dude. o'clock. I'm sorry, I cannot make out what you're saying. Call back often and frequently call is not, with the uh, same call, call is not quality. Great. I'm sorry That's about that. That's why there's topics. Uh, calling from a 703 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 703. 703 area code. Calling once. 703. 703. 703. Good day. Calling from a 406 area code. You got 30 seconds. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam, this is Brennan from Montana. Brennan from Montana. Um, I just wanted to ask you, well, first off, that uh, first caller was a grade-A moron. I can't even handle that crap. Um, the main thing I wanted to call for was to ask you, how do you organize in a rural area like uh, I live in Montana where people are just so inactive and don't give a damn about things like climate change? Um, I tried to start a sunrise movement chapter here. It went all right for a little while, fell. Now I'm with a few friends doing a, uh, it's called the Northern Rockies Socialist Rifle Association that we just started. So Hell yeah. hopefully we have better luck with that. But any tips you have? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, frankly, you know, um, I think you're on to something insofar as like wrapping into something social. I mean, you know, I would imagine uh, that the other attribute of living on Montana is that there's not necessarily a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if you can wrap it into something social as well, then uh, maybe you're on to something. Are the national parks under attack over there? Because that might be an issue to rally around. Uh Well, we we haven't been raking them enough, I don't think, either, because they keep lighting on fire. That's why I thought maybe the... um, climate thing would strike with some people but 
Well, mm-hmm. conservation is always big out there, and you start uh, where people are, and then you bring them to where you want mm-hmm. them to go. Appreciate yeah, the talk call. Talk to Brett at Rev Left Radio. He's got Thank some you. good ideas on being a leftist organizer in a rural red state. Um, also, one thing that he said to us that I thought I hadn't really thought of before was when you are a leftist organizer in a place like that where there's so few of you, um, it kind of feeds into like a nice kind of left unity that we don't always have in places like New York City because you really have to work together despite whatever um, factional differences you may have, you know. Calling from a 651 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, Hey, Sam. This is Isaac from Minnesota. Isaac from Minnesota. You are the third to last caller. 30 seconds. Go. Oh, boy. All right. So this is going to be a bit of a scattershot call. Um, Michael, um, first off, uh, Lula Libre. And um, do you have a release date on on the book yet? Do February. you want to be able to get it for Christmas? Uh, no, sorry. February. It's going to be after okay. Christmas. Apologies. I'm, sh- I'm sure it'll be worth it. But speaking Thank of you. some contents of the book, um, I know a lot of people wanted to uh, talk about the Tulsa Gabbard and Dave Rubin bit, but I don't know if you guys saw him, but Sam Harris was on David Pakman. And I was listening to that. It was just a, it was a hilarious display of David repeatedly having to tell Sam, no, Sam, the, these mean little lefties you're dealing with are not everybody. And Sam Harris is just a very petulant person. And I think one of the biggest things I got from him is that he has this idea that he's the only rational actor and everybody else is a monolith of, of idiocy. It was a fascinatingly dumb uh, performance by Sam. And I was just wondering right. if you guys had checked that out or if you were going to Hadn't it. seen it yet. May cover it. Appreciate the call. Thanks, man. All right, we got two more calls. Calling from an 810 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Spencer from Flint. Spencer from Flint. You got 30 seconds. Go. All right. Just wanted to say I love the majority report. I don't miss a single one, not even a show. And I wanted to know your opinion on gain unionization, uh, specifically with Valve. And you know what? You kind of remind me of a little character from a Valve software video game, Sam. Sam looks like the Half-Life uh, main character, I think you're saying? No, no. He uh, looks like a character from Left 4 Dead 2, because you're the biggest fucking boomer I've ever met. I love you guys. All right. Have a great night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey. I don't know that hey. reference. I don't know any of the references, but it sounded like if I did, it would have been funny. Did he just call you a boomer? Yeah, I appreciate I that it. part. Call him from a 518 area code. I'm not. I'm technically a Gen Xer. More than technically. Well, I am a Gen Xer. Yeah. You're definitely. Call him from a 518 area code. You are the final caller of the day. You got 30 seconds. Go. 518. 518. You are not the final Hello. caller. Hello. <laughs> you are not the final caller of the day. 727. Call from a 727 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello. Did we lose the phones? 727. Last one. Call from a 319 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? We are done with calls, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. We will see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made For the option where you don't get paid